How you doing? We are back. This is African Frame Podcast. Uh, I'm sure you're used to us by now. If you're not, that means you are new. And if you are new, don't forget to like and subscribe, comment, and check out any of our co- content that we've been uploading. This is African Frame, and I'm not alone as usual. I'm with Rob Sibeko. What do we do here? We actually dissect movies, man. We do rom-coms, we do uh, thrillers, we're going to do horrors, we do comedies, we do animation, we do any film genre, you know what I mean? Because uh, we just love movies. We grew up watching movies, we love them. Uh, so yeah, like I said, I'm not alone, I'm with Rob. Rob is a director, um, he's a filmmaker, he's, he's, he's an author, um, and he actually has a new book out. I believe he'll tell us about that. Uh, and yeah, today we're going to be doing, um, I guess you could say this is the movie that put Bruce Willis on the map, which is called Die Hard. Uh, Die Hard came out, I believe, in... 1980. 1980? 88, yeah. Oh, okay. That's the year I was born, eh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, came out in 1988, and it's actually based on a book by Roderick Thorpe. Um, the, the novel actually came out in 1979, uh, which is called Nothing Lasts Forever. And, uh, oh yeah, it starts um, Bruce Willis. Uh, it also has uh, Alan Rickman, uh, Alexander Good, Godnuf, Godnuf? <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm butchering that name, and Bonnie Bedelia. Uh, I'm sure we know, we all know Bruce Willis. I mean, he's been in so many movies. I mean, he has said it himself that he will do movies until he's old and wrinkled. So, uh, and he lived up to that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's done movies such as The Sixth Sense. Um, he's done, um, sure, uh, Split. No, not Split, uh, Glass. And the one before Glass, I think it's Unbreakable. Unbreakable, yes. Um, and then he's also done The Fifth Element. Mm-hmm. Tears of the Sun. Tears of the Sun. Yeah. Um, he was in Expandables. I, I feel like I'm not doing this man enough justice. Like, he's been in so many great movies. Six Monkeys. Is it 12 Monkeys? 12 wow. Monkeys. One of the best movies of all time. Yeah. yeah. The Sixth Sense, The Last Boy Scout, Pulp Fiction, uh, The Whole Nine Yards. He was in Looper. You know, so he's that guy. <laughs> yeah. Is that guy? But I think honestly, I honestly think there's no character that he has done that is better than John McClane. Like John McClane is the guy. <laughs> He's yeah. the guy that we know him by. Just like Sylvester Stallone is either Rambo or Rocky. But I think the the name that comes through first is Rambo, right? I would say in terms of relatability, if you want, maybe the first Rambo, maybe. But in terms of relatability, I think Rocky kind of. That's the kind of the people's guy, you know what I mean? Right. I mean, there's right. literally a statue of Rocky Balbe- Balboa. Oh, yeah, a real statue, yeah. The one that was done in the film, but it's still somewhere. Yeah. It's still erected somewhere, I remember. But those stairs in Philadelphia, yeah. That is amazing, man. And then there's uh, Alan Rickman. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would say that apart from Hans Gruber, that he played in Die Hard, mm-hmm. we mostly know this man as Snape from Lord of the Rings. Go to page 164. And Harry Potter. Pardon? Harry Potter, not Lord of the Rings. Oh, my my goodness. I'm so sorry. I didn't even hear myself say say Lord of the Rings. Yeah, Harry Potter. My apologies. Uh, Harry Potter. Um, And uh, yeah, he's been in a lot of movies. Love Actually. I think this is the third movie in a row that we're mentioning Love Actually. (laughs) Someone being in Love Actually. Um, He was in... Pardon? Such a big cast. Yeah, that's true. Uh, he was in Robin, the Prince of Thieves. Um, he was in um, Galaxy Quest, which is a funny uh-huh. movie. Uh-huh. It's yeah. one of the movies that we need to... Because <laughs> yeah. he was like the Spock. In yeah. that... <laughs> oh, man. And then he, he did The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yes, as the robot. Uh, yes, and then he did... Uh, um, Sydney taught the the barber of Fleet Street, which was directed by um, who's this guy? The guy who did the Batman, not not the Batman, but Batman. Tim Burton. Tim Burton. Yes, Tim Burton. Um, and he was in Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass. Yes, as the cat, as the cat. Yes. Yes, and then uh, you have Alexander 
Kodinov, um, he's a Russian. Um, I don't really know much about him, to be honest with you. I'm surprised, yeah. He's, yeah, he's kind of, I guess he's more European, so his stuff would be more European stuff, so stuff mm-hmm. you wouldn't really know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even I though he's got a Harrison Ford movie here, The Witness, so that's pretty Witness. cool. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you also have uh, Bonnie Bedelia, uh, who played uh, John's wife. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And she's oh, she's okay, yeah. yes, and she was in a soap opera called Love of Life, um, and uh, she was in the Prince of Pennsylvania, Presumed Innocent, and Needful Things. I think one of the people that I really need us to um, acknowledge is Reginald Vell Johnson. Yeah. Uh, he was in Family Matters as Carl Win- Winslow. I think that's his probably yes. his breakout role. That's his biggest role, definitely. Yeah, and the fact that he's dressed like Carl Winslow in here. <laughs> yep, yeah, it fits so nicely. Yeah. You could be like, it's canon. It's all in the same thing. Yeah. Uh, the last time I actually saw him in anything was in uh, Station 19, which is a series that's basically related to um, Grey's Anatomy. Mm. So it's within the Shonda Rhimes universe, basically. Yeah, man, and uh, I think he also does a voice. He, he provides a voice over role in uh, Invincible. Oh, it's Invincible, yes. Yes, because there's a school named after him, eh? <laughs> and he's actually the principal of the school in the animation. So yeah, I guess uh, uh, the 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 creator. He's the guy who created uh, what's this? The Walking Dead. He he really likes this guy because the fact that he mentioned his real name and surname in his yeah. story <laughs> it means that he likes this guy. Yeah. But he's a legend, man. He's a legend. So if anything is underrated, there's almost too little of him out there. One hundred percent. Like he should be one of the A-listers, to be honest. I don't know why he's not. Yeah, I think something happened to him in the past. Something kind of like how John Mutinian had something happen to him with the whole going to jail thing. I think he also went to jail. I'm not sure. I think mm-hmm. something happened. That's but I think, like a gap in his, I think uh, I could I stand to be corrected, but I think usually shows that that air on UPN. I don't know if Family Matters aired on UPN, but usually shows that air on UPN are not as that like, like the actors that are not as famous as they should be. Like Jalil White is supposed to be an A-lister, you know what I mean? Yeah, of course. So I'm it just sure feels like the black to... people. Yeah. We love them. Yeah. But they're not like a. They're not people that would be sitting on the front row. They're not like Denzel Washington, and they should be, or Viola Davis, and they should be, you know. But anyway, I guess yeah. those are politics that we'll never fully comprehend or understand. Um, but yeah, that is basically the cost of Die Hard. Yeah. Yeah. At least the main cost for like that. Yeah, let's let's just put it like that. That's the main cast. Because I don't know who the journalist is. Like, I don't know his real name. I don't know who okay. the... Okay, wait, wait. Let me get that for you. It, it's got it written here. Oh, all right. It's Thorpe is um, William Atherton? Yeah, oh, okay. Atherton. And you've seen him a few things. Mm. Um, one of the home... Oh, uh, straight... Um, I'm sure you've seen him in a few things, definitely. I probably have. It's just that, you know, I guess... He's in the TV show Castle. Um, okay. He was... There we go. Ghostbusters. He's the guy that tries to shut them down in Ghostbusters. Remember the famous line? Um, this man has... No, he's. You're right. This man has no penis. <laughs> 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 Remember that? Like, he's calling me dickless. <laughs> we, need to, we need to do a Ghostbusters. Yes. Thing. Definitely. Like I would say the the first two, we need to do. Uh, yes, those are the ones worth doing, definitely. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think we can we can get started. Yeah. Now. I don't know if there's anything else you want me to mention. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Usually I talk about the the box office, right? How yeah. much it made. Mm-hmm. Um. So basically, they had a budget of twenty five to thirty five million. And they made between 139.8 to 141.5 million at the box office. Nice. You yeah. Of course, a classic. And I would say that this is the strongest 
film. Like, this is the best film in the entire franchise. I'd put this one at number one. I'd put this one at number one and then put the third one at number two. Then put the third one, the second one at number three, and then put the fourth one at number four. <laughs> and then put the five in the trash. Yeah, put the five in hot garbage. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah. they're trying to make Jai Courtney a thing. They were determined. Yeah, hey, he was just not working, eh? <laughs> I mean, at point, he was everywhere, dude. The guy was in Terminator Genesis. He was the new Cal... Who's this? Is it Cal Reese? Was the new Cal um, Reese? Yes, Cal Reese at some point, yes. Spartacus. Then yeah. he was in Divergent. Then he was... It's like, stop, dog. dog. Stop dog. trying to make this man a thing. Wasn't he in Last Man of Standing as well? Was it Last Man with Mark Wahlberg, the soldier one? Is it? I know Taylor Kitsch was there. Because I remember all of those guys... Was see, to even, be even Taylor Kitsch, they tried to make yeah. him a thin. I think he was in John Carpenter or something. Yes, right? John Carter, yeah. Oh, sorry, John Carter. And then he was also Gambit in yep. uh, Wolverine Origins. Origins, yes. And then, you know who's who's also try, they're trying to make a thing, but he's not just, it's just not working? Ooh. Aaron, Aaron Taylor, is it Aaron Taylor Johnson? Kick ass. Oh, I think they gave up after Godzilla. I feel like he hasn't really been in as many stuff. After Godzilla, they gave up. Man. Was it Godzilla? Yes. Not the, the newish one. Yeah. The old, the, remember this? You get the old school Matthew Broderick one. Yes. You know, they made a new Godzilla with that guy, that the director um, that everyone loves. I forgot his name now. But yeah, he was the guy, kick-ass guy. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, I mean, he was in Avengers as Quicksilver. Hmm. Uh, and now he's craving the hunter, but it's just not working. Something is just not working there. He's also got bad timing. I mean, the superhero genre is dead, and Sony is not making good things, and then he becomes craven. That's just yeah. Bad. I think it's it, it's something that you also mentioned earlier that sometimes you have the right person. I mean, also Rick Rubin. Okay, okay. Let me just say two things. Rick Rubin spoke about creativity that sometimes you can come up with the best thing, but the timing is off, which is what you're saying now. Yeah. But I think sometimes it's like you mentioned when we were talking about Zoe Saldana that sometimes it's just that you just have horrible a horrible agent, or you just you just choosing bad, um, yeah. bad uh, projects. Unfortunately, yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. Because let's be honest, the Hollywood star has died. We don't have the like people often consider Tom Cruise to be the last Hollywood star. Yep. Yeah. We don't and have no one watch Mission Impossible. We thought that was the case, especially after Top Gun. When he brought back Top Gun, everyone came back for him. They came yeah. back for him. But right. then now uh, with Mission Impossible, um, I don't know if that was just bad luck. Mm. But yeah, that one fell apart. Don't even get me started on the mummy. Yeah. So, yeah. We just don't have a Hollywood star anymore. Like we just don't have we just don't look at these people at the red cup and feel like, wow, these are yeah. beyond our reach. Stop. Like, we take That's everything they, they say seriously, and they're so mysterious because most of them are on social media. We start knowing who they are. Like, we yeah. start seeing behind the veil. You know what I mean? True. Uh, it, yeah, so. True, but now I would say it's gone to the director now. Look at. Uh, um, yeah. The directors are the superstars now. Yeah, because um, it also used to be about what the movies, what they used to pick. Arnold used to pick his movies pretty carefully, if you think about it. Yes. The Sixth Day. Um, Total Recall, legendary after legendary movie. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Will Smith, you kind of have an, you had an expectation with mm. Will Smith. Mm. You don't have that anymore. Yeah. One second he's doing Hancock, which is cool. Um, Wild Wild. You next thing you know he's doing um, what's it? Collateral damage or something. What is it called again? You uh, talking about uh, that movie? You talking about a movie that is currently working on? No, no, the one before that. One. Not um before the tennis one. The one where, like, with all the old people, I forgot what it's called. But anyway, it was a bad, wasn't good. No one the cared. Old, the old people. Yeah, I forgot what it was called, man. But yeah, no one cared. Where he was, where he was uh, mourning the death of his daughter. Maybe I think that's the one. Yeah, I didn't even watch it. I just know about it. Just no one really cared. With Edward Norton and Helen Mirren. Yes, <laughs> that's the one. Yeah. I didn't even watch it myself, dude. I watched it. It's not bad. Yeah. But that's the thing. Will Smith used to not be not bad. He used to be show up every few years with something great. Even Hancock was good. You know what I think happened with Will Smith? And you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think 
You remember when it, yesterday when we were talking about movies that need um, projects where actors were robbed from the Oscars? Mm-hmm. I think personally, I think he was supposed to get an award for Pursuit of Happiness. Okay. And, and because he didn't, he started making movies where he should get an award, but he never did. Concussion is like a movie that where you can tell he was hoping to get an award. Um, Every African is like, that is the worst Nigerian accent I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> uh, my friend! <laughs> what, what's the other one? Seven Pounds is like that as well. Oscar but, Bait. Yeah, it's Oscar yeah. Bait. He started doing Oscar Bait projects. Even yeah. After Earth, for me, felt like an Oscar Bait project. You know what I mean? Yeah, which is so, so funny. I think that's why I think that's why he he started dropping the ball. But I do get it because I mean after you're making such millions in sci-fi and action and comedy, what else can you do? Do more, <laughs> make more money. <laughs> I don't th- I don't think it was enough anymore. I don't think it was enough anymore. Okay, but... ah, don't even get me started on that whole Zen bullshit. Okay, this is a discussion actually I had with. This is I was discussing. You could call it a philosophical philosophical philosophy discussion i was having right right will smith was having some kind of is clearly having some kind of inner peace moment that he's having right and okay. it's producing movies that aren't exactly making all of us proud do you know what i mean right whereas before when he was saying he was going through an emotional turmoil of trying to live up to some invisible standard right, right. He was some of the best movies we've ever seen yes he was out here making all of us proud right, right. You know what I mean? He was because he was being Will Smith, the Will Smith yeah. that we like. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And don't forget something. What? Maybe there's what ten great black actors out there right mm. now. In Hollywood. Well, no, there's almost zero right now in Hollywood. Do you know what I mean? It's all these smaller roles that. Remember, I'm not saying there aren't any good actors, mm. but genuinely great. Mm. And by great is an objective standard. Like right. Eminem, you don't have to like Eminem, but you have to admit that he's great. Right. You know what I mean? Right. You, you have to admit that. You don't have to admit that. Um, Insert black actor from 2023 here. You don't have to admit that he's great. Right. Um, let me give you an example. I love, um, what's his face? Kang the Conqueror. I love that. Yes, uh, I wanted to get there that you can tell that there's a li- there's a certain, I could say like 10 actors that maybe were supposed to become the next big yeah. stars. Black. Yeah. Um, I'm talking about Jay Ellis. Jay Ellis was in um, the movie that you're talking about now with Tom Cruise. Top Gun was yeah. there. He was in Insecure. And then speaking of Insecure, you have... Uh, Issa Rae, mm-hmm. right? And then you have uh, Childish Gambino or Donny Glover. Oh, yes, yes. And then you have the guy, the two other guys from Atlanta. I forgot their names, man. Uh, but those two... Lake Boy and what's his name? They call I think him? it's Lake, Lake Stanfield and I forgot the other guy, man. Oh, uh, like, you the guy from Get Out. No, no, the guy from Bullet Train. Oh, yes, yes, yes. He yes. was also that's in the right. They call him Big Boy, isn't that? In the movie yeah, Big Boy, but his real name. Yes, that oh, guy. Oh, yes. And then you're right. Daniel Kuluya is also one of them. Get yeah. Out and, and stuff he like that. He played L, even though it was a weird version of L. These people are doing these things, but I don't have to admit they're great. I can say they're bad. Look at their numbers and, and people have to agree with me. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? There's mm-hmm. nothing that says you have that they that you have to say they're great. Samuel Jackson is has produced more revenue than any act, any other actor in the history of mankind. You right. have to admit he's great. Right. Denzel Washington is a draw. Whether or not you like him or not, he is right. a draw. You have to admit that he's great. Actually, speaking of I, speaking of Denzel Washington and Samuel L. Jackson, there was a discussion on Vlad TV. Yeah. Where Michael J. White actually said that, and I don't know what you think about this. You'll let me know. Um, but he basically said that, Every role that Denzel has played, Samuel L. Jackson can play, but not every role that Samuel L. Jackson has played, Denzel can play. I've actually seen that clip. Well, I understand what he was trying to say. And I, I agree, agree with him, actually. But I don't fully agree because um, I don't think... Um, first of all, they're two different age groups. You have to remember something. Samuel L. Jackson started old. <laughs> yeah, but I think they went to the it, same school, though. Yeah, probably. Yeah, because if, if you listen to Samuel L. Jackson speak mostly... They were around the same time. They were around the same school, around the same time. In mm. a way. Maybe not the same levels or grades or whatever, but it's like they were around the same time. But anyway. See, yeah, but I hear what you're saying. Look, Samuel Jackson has a higher sense of gravitas. I think that's the case. Okay. He commands a room better than Denzel Washington. But I think Denzel Washington has, like Will Smith, like Brad Pitt. Star power. No, no, no. 
it's a thing that uh, Joel Clooney as well. Where when they play themselves, no one can beat them. Brad Pitt, when he plays himself, is fantastic. Don't mm. give me wrong. Sometimes he challenges himself and he plays like maybe like twelve. The role he plays, the crazy guy, in twelve monkeys. Then he challenges himself. He produces something great. Mm. But if, but most of the time he's playing Brad Pitt, and it's fantastic. Right. Um, and it's indisputably great. When George right. Clooney plays George Clooney, yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, which and which role has there. George Clooney played where we feel like he's not George Clooney? I don't even know, dude. Three exactly. kids, he's George Clooney. Exactly. Um, I watched exactly. Michael Clayton is George Clooney. I can't even think of one. Daniel Ocean, Bruce yeah. Wayne. The only time it's either he's goofy or he's serious, but he's always yeah. George Clooney. Yes. That makes sense. No, no, it does. It like, does. For it's, example, like, it's like Antonio Banderas. Same thing. Antonio Banderas always plays Antonio Banderas. It's always himself. <laughs> <laughs> and what you do with it is what ruins the movie or makes it good. Yeah. Like I think when Antonio Banderas is cool, like in Expendables two or three, they try to make him look like Goofy or something like that, and it came off as kind of lame. I kind but of see. I that's just, the thing. When they don't take the project that they're working on seriously, uh-huh. that's what happens. Because funny enough, when he was in SpongeBob, yeah. he killed it, dog. <laughs> because it's Antonio Banderas, yes. He murked it, dog. I was like, yo. Whoever's directing SpongeBob, this SpongeBob movie is a freaking genius. Like I got the best out of him. Yeah. Like I hate SpongeBob movies, but I love that movie just because of Antonio Banderas. Though I was like, ah, no, he killed it. <laughs> but I guess it's like it's also the same thing with. Uh, okay, guys, you know. Okay, if you're new, just know that we do like trivia stuff for like the first thirty minutes, right? <laughs> so that's what's happening here. Wesley Snipes. Um, same thing. Wesley Snipes for me. Doesn't really play Wesley Snipes everywhere. He kills it. But yeah. nowadays, I don't know what's going on with him. I just don't feel him anymore. Ah, dude, post-jail Wesley Snipes. Yeah, post-jail Wesley Snipes is not as good as, good as pre-jail. Yeah, I think that... I don't, I, the thing is, Wesley Snipes had an ego and a half in the past, dude. Yeah, I think after he started making millions past. from Blade, things changed. Yeah. Yeah, that was the beginning of the end, basically. Yeah, but it's kind of unfortunate, because again, I love Wesley Snipes. Eddie Murphy, I think, is a surprisingly talented actor, too. I think he can actually do a lot. Um, I yeah. think... But uh, I think like 80s, 90s, early 2000s, Eddie was unstoppable. Yes. That's because he was playing Eddie, I think. Then I think he tried to do other things. Yeah. And that kind of took away from it. Like, remember that weird one where he wasn't allowed to speak? I thought he did yes. okay. Uh, what, was, what was that movie it called again? A good movie. It's something about words. What what words? Yeah. Uh, yeah, where... 80 words or something like that. Yeah, remember. I like that movie though, eh? Yeah. But I would say the movie let him down more than his performance did, if that makes sense. Yes, it's kind of like Meet Dave. You remember Meet Dave? Yes, Meet Dave. I remember that one. It's like a Star Wars par- no Star Trek parody, but instead of a ship, it's a human. Yes, classic. Uh, but they had are... a very weird phase there. Yeah. You know, he had a, he had a very weird. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Because for me, when I look at the prince in the first coming to America, mm-hmm. that is, I always feel like that is not Eddie Murphy. I feel like that guy and the prince in Remember the Time, Michael Jackson's Remember the Time, I feel like that's the same person. All right? Like that that whole, why is beyond your ear, uh, why is beyond, you, beyond your ears, sorry, beyond your ears, Hey, Dad, my ears are wise. (laughs) Wise beyond your ears. Extremely intelligent um, guy, you know? That, for me, was the coming to America guy and the guy in Remember the Time. But then when you watch, like, Beverly Hills Cop, you see he's smart, but he's still Eddie Murphy. He's still very funny. But it worked. 48 hours, Beverly Hills Cop. Eddie Murphy playing Eddie Murphy is still a masterpiece. 100%. He can also play something else. And he got the shit snapped out of him in Golden Girls. He can play a bad guy. Remember when he was a vampire? That like Wait, is, it, was it, is it the gold, you mean Golden Child, not Golden Girls? Was in Golden Girls? Is Golden Girls one of Beyonce where he plays the um, Dream Girls? Dream Girls. There we go. Dream Girls. Right. right. He plays the, like the other singer. He should have yeah, got. He killed it, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he should have got a nomination. He got a nomination, but he didn't win the award. Yes. He won that award. Yeah. Um, him playing a darker character. Comedians playing darker characters works 100% of the time. 100%. Jim Carrey is a good yes, example. Jamie exactly. Foxx is a good example. And, and we never got more of it from Eddie. He should have done more. And I think that's probably his agent's fault, or I don't know whose fault it is. But he could have done more with that. 
type of role. Right. Yeah, and not necessarily being the the main protagonist or the center of attention. I mean, like his role in Dream Girls, he wasn't the main guy. Yeah. But it doesn't have to, you don't have to carry the weight. Look at Jack Sparrow. You don't have to carry all the weight. It doesn't have to be you. Mm. It can be you can just be next to the main character and then steal the show. Sometimes like, you see, if- that's the thing for me. Like I feel like <clears throat> Pirates of the Caribbean, mm-hmm. once Jack Sparrow started pulling the weight, for me it started really it started dropping. dropping, yeah. Now um, yeah. And I think that's that's why they were very smart with Big Bang Theory. They knew that Sheldon was not going to be able to carry the show by himself. Yes. Because they knew that uh, uh, what's this guy, Leonard and Penny were the main main characters, right? Yes. And then when they shifted, what they did is they made sure to give Sheldon a, a girlfriend. Yes. And then to give um, who's this guy, uh, Howard, a Ooh. girlfriend. Yeah. Right. And then also to make sure that uh, Howard and Penny are strong as a couple. Yeah. So they 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 Chandler and Monica to everybody, almost everybody there. And that's what because if you remember correctly, for me, I feel like Chandler and Monica were the first couple that yeah. really gave friends an extra edge to make it more interesting and more more. and almost every other sitcom that came after that tried to be friends whether it's how i met your mother new girl or big bang they they copied the whole monica and chandler thing and that's why it works i can hear what you're saying definitely yeah yeah definitely i mean i also do think i lost it now Uh, we were talking about um before that we were talking about um rising hollywood stars that never made it or I never mind. I lost it. Oh, I was sorry. gonna say something about um shit, no man. I think we're also talking we're just talking about uh, this is before we're talking about Big Talk Bang. about friends, no man. Big Bang Theory, yes, yes. Big Bang Theory talks um I think the re- another reason why Sheldon couldn't be the star of the show, and I think it affects a lot of character tropes, is the Spock type. Is the Spock dilemma. I think I've discussed this with you before. I don't think uh, so. one of the problems with Spock. Um, is that he has no emotions. Yes. Same thing with Hitman, Agent 47. If oh, you yeah. have no emotions, we can't rest a show on your reactions because you don't have reactions. <laughs> right. Do you know what I mean? Right. Because um, you'll see it, I think I talk about it here in Die Hard as well, um, the power of reactions, which we've discussed repeatedly throughout mm. our entire series. Mm. Um, so if you can't react, then we can't use you. So right. um, Spock could never be a showrunner, I mean, ahead a of a show, and things you could never be ahead of a show, which is why having a good actor matters so much as well. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, if you can't react properly, then what are we doing here? Yeah. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah, but guys, yeah, that is our, our normal uh, trivia yeah. moment before nah, the movie starts. <laughs> yeah. I guess if we were on TV, you would say that before the commercial break, I mean, this is, would be the moment when we'd have a commercial break. Oh, this, is when, this is when people are just finishing off their, their, their they still keep cooking and, you know what I mean, they they, they wash their dishes, but they can okay. hear in the background before okay. they sit down, before uh, we discuss the movie. <laughs> well, funny enough, I'm sure some, some people would be like, this is the show. This is, the this rest, is they the turn off. They turn it off, they be like, okay, I got what I wanted, I'll see you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you never really know. You know what I mean? Like you never, Absolutely. you honestly never know what happens. Never know, hundred yeah, percent. That's true. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so let us start. Okay, the opening images of a plane landing and a tight fist as a passenger sees a terrified John McClane, more frightened than you like to see him throughout the entire movie. <laughs> he's yeah. just yeah, he's freaking out over the whole landing of plane. Yeah. The passenger gives him take off um, advice to take off his shoes when he gets to his location and to walk around barefoot on a rug. Yeah, and and and, act, and and then make fuss with his toes. This becomes very relevant later on. Yep. <laughs> um. So there's a scene there where once the plane lands, uh, he takes out his luggage and then he's looking at this lady, and the lady's looking back at him. And I was like, what's the significance of this? Ah, yes. I did research on the book. Apparently, he had a um, like he started having. I guess they're not really pen pals, but over the phone, a uh, relationship with a stewardess from the okay. plane. So I guess that was like an homage to. Oh, uh, okay, nice. Like I did not the, know that because like, 
That come, that doesn't it never really comes into play, but he does look at girls a lot. There's a a naked picture. Yes, yeah, so we'll get that. <laughs> we'll get that. <laughs> yeah, but I like to think because remember he talks. Yeah, I feel like it gives you a clue about his marriage as well. But yes, mm, uh, yeah. the scene then cuts to the office party at the Nakatomi Park Tower, um, where the boss himself is is talking while the boss is talking. We see a lady walking away, looking at paperwork. While everyone else is having fun, she's still doing work. Right. Um, we discover that the she is Holly McLean and she's being hit by us by the sleazy Ellis. Um, she shuts that down and we see her talking to her kids and we see family for photos on the table reinforcing the picture of their marriage. Yes, and, but she's yeah. referring to herself as Holly uh, Gennaro. Yes, yes, yeah, it's the first time it's mentioned, you're right. And um, there's a little nice little clue there. Basically, what's happening here is they're setting up all the chess pieces. Right. You don't know they're setting up all the chess pieces, but they are. All right. of this will become relevant later on. Just open because it's like a dumb action movie. But yeah, um, there's very little time to set things up before the action. But the director is doing everything he can to paint two types of characters out here, stacking them up as high as possible. Mm. Here's a point. Here's a point. Here's a point. Here's a point. Mm. Um, an image of the marriage is being drawn at least three times. Um, John goes from the landing to driving to him getting there. This process takes nine minutes. Yeah. So we just pa pa pa. We here. Right. This is the type uh, of fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. this, that's why he actually starts meet, meeting the limo driver. Yeah. Argyle. Yeah. Argyle. Yeah. Argyle is one nosy dude. Like, <laughs> but I guess you could tell he's very young. He's still young. You know what I mean? It's his first time driving a limo, a limo, so he doesn't even know the etiquette of treating clients and stuff because yeah. he used to be a cab driver. So he has no idea how to now, um, I guess, yeah, present himself as a, as a limo driver. He doesn't know what to do. It's kind of funny now that you went up over that thing, right? But the, the, that this is based on a book. And you see the writing credits. Um, Thorpe is on there as a writing credit. Mm. I feel like this is book writing. I wouldn't be surprised if this is a book writing element. Because sometimes a lot of movie makers will abandon this kind of... Um, um, use of um, retelling ideas, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, of, you know, of callbacks, um, where something is relevant to this, relevant to this, relevant to that. Mm -hmm. And you know, like, a lot of book writers will do that. A lot mm -hmm. of movie writers will like, will, like, key point, key point, key point, key point, because not enough time. And I, oh. think, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they worked together in order to, and then Thorpe worked hard to make sure that there was enough time. Was a consultant. I mean? mm. Yeah. Like, he really had a part to play in this. I wouldn't be surprised. But McTurnan is a very cool guy. P.S. Guy is directed by John McTurnan. Same guy who did Basic. Um, right. Cool, cool. Uh, uh, what do you mean by directed? Basic. He's Basic. the one that directed Basic? Yes. Oh, okay. The guy who went to jail? Yeah. Basic. Oh. Predator, die hard. Actually, that's the one that we didn't mention. We didn't mention the director, so mm -hmm. there you go, guys. That's the director. <laughs> yep, you can hear his name more than once. Um, this type of front loan is done on TV shows by doing something very much like saving the cat, mm -hmm. which is where the expression comes from. You know the expression save the cat? Yes. Um, the save the cat being the idea that you start a story off with, with an action that shows why you should be rooting for the character. Right. You know, something positive that gets you behind them. Um, in this in this case, saving the cat is quite literally something different, because what happens here is they set up the um, they set up instead um, the marriage and they set up the assignment that John is that John's assignment, which is to kind of fix the marriage in a way. Yes. It's with the cab conversation. Yes. Um, uh, and no that's like she called him to come, right? She said she must come. He must come. She invited him. Yes. Yes. Um, she was even worried he might not come, but he does come. Um, so yeah, we know the mission. He's got to get the wife back. Yes. Um, you know what I mean? Yes. Before and Argyle stays, which is another chess piece in case things go wrong. Right. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, so he's now going to the building with his mission set. Right. Now we know his mission. We're following now. Right. Um, cool, cool. John's mission is to save the marriage. He's fly. He's flown to California despite being afraid of flying. His wife still wants to be with him, rejecting others and following up on him but is mad with him, which is why she slams the photo down. Another chess piece. Mm. Uh, the, uh, I'm not the, sure I, what he did, though, but 
I guess it is implied in the movie, but we'll get there. What? What's implied? That um, he was not happy with the fact that she got this job. Yeah, I mean, he's afraid of flying, which is probably why he's not there. Yes. Um, yeah, exactly. There's little pieces without being said of exactly yeah. that, yes. One step into the building and there's already an obstacle that ends, up, that ends up working, showing up later. His wife is not marked under his name. It's her maiden name, which lets you know the trouble he's in. And yeah. that upsets him. Right. Um, we, see, we get a couple of scenes of him walking um, and the limo parking, sitting up chair, more chess pieces. Um, we enter the party and John is a fish out of water. It is a wholly different world. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, John, like for the guy kisses him, he's like, like, what the hell is going on? Like, it's too corporate for someone like John, man. Someone uh-huh. comes in, kisses him, is like, what yeah. the hell, kind of California? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> yeah, he's just like, what California stuff is this? Yeah. Um, yeah. John is meeting the big boss. We meet Ellis, too, who is doing a line of coke just to show how much of a problem it is in the storyline. Like, yeah. damn. Um, I really cool. like the boss, though. Hey, what's his name again? Ta- oh, Ellis. No, not Ellis. Ellis is boss. Um, Doctor, uh, Mr. Tucker. I keep calling him Tucker. Um, is it Ta- Takayami? It is Takagi. Who? Takagi. Takagi. But, yeah, the real actor's name is James Shigita. Oh, okay. All right. And I'm sure you've seen him a few times, actually. I would oh, say he's more famous. Oh, Takaki. Takaki, yes, yes. Yeah. He's Mulan. He's in. He's the General Lee from Mulan. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Loved him, man. He's, you can tell this man, like, you can tell that he is a veteran actor of no, because yeah, the way he was acting, he was just on another level, man. Yeah. Yeah. And he's also the old wanderer in Avatar The Last Airbender. Mm, he's a oh, voice okay. actor there. Oh, okay. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> hey, man. Yeah, it's weird. When you do research on these people, yeah. you realize that there's a lot that you don't know about them. Exactly. Um, cool. So 40 minutes in, we cut to a truck and we get it. By the way, all the, the music that he's playing so far has been Ode to Joy, um, plus a mix of other songs. But now we get a darker version of that song. Um, Old the, the, the Joy. Yeah, that's the name of the song. What's that? Um, that. Do, 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 yeah. yeah. Is that, that stuff is the main theme? Is the main motif of the movie? That's Who's the that? scene. Yeah. Is it Beethoven? Who's that? Um, it's not. It's. I'm. I'm seventy percent sure it's not Beethoven. Is it Mozart? Uh, no, but I know it's not. Um, is it not Mozart? Uh, oh no, it is Beethoven. My bad. It is Beethoven. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah, Ludwig van Beethoven. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So that you'll notice that song is. If you pay attention, that song is playing throughout the entire movie. Oh, it's really? our theme music. I didn't yeah. pay attention to that. That's why this. Whenever people say it's not a Christmas movie, I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? They're playing. First of all, it's setting Christmas. The theme music is basically joyous celebration Christmas music. Right. What are you talking about? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> How is it not Christmas? Right. Like, it actually matters that it's Christmas. It's not. It just doesn't have the typical, well, the stereotypical themes in a Christmas yes, movie. Family coming together. Guy gets together with his wife. How many Hallmark movies have you seen like that? Yes, there's more guns involved this time. Yes, that's the thing. Like, that's what I wanted to say. Like, yeah. It's a Christmas movie masquerading as an action yeah. blockbuster movie, I guess. Exactly. If, if you don't think it's a Christmas movie, then Home Alone isn't a Christmas movie. Then that's that's what I can say to you. <laughs> Home Alone isn't a Christmas movie, and I can mention like five other movies in that don't count by your by by some people's definitions. But right. anyway, um <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, that that scene lasts about a split second. Again, more chess pieces. With all that build-up, finally, the couple talk. And we get a picture of the marriage and the pair, and the pair that the struggle they're going through. They quite clearly love each other. Yes. John has such a great sense of pride. Like, she's out here going, I miss you. And yeah. he's like, oh, but not enough to, to use my name. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. You are so yeah. petty in that <laughs> moment. Eh? Like, dude, your wife called you here. Mm-hmm. He's, he's making sure that you meet her bosses. 
and she's just saying, look, man, I miss you. And you're like, if you miss me so much, God, then I'm like, yo, Joy. Are you trying to win a fight or win a wife? Which are, which are you trying to do? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Well, what are you doing? Why are you handing yourself <laughs> out like this? Why? Why would you do this? I think he's a, he's a traditional man. I think he's a traditional... Oh. Um, I could understand that on some level, but I think what it is is, and I think it's set up throughout the storyline, by the way. It's very cleverly set up, quietly set up. And this is where you can tell a writer was involved here, is that um, John McClane is prideful. He has a... if Because remember, we are talking about character weaknesses before? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. John McClane is smothered in pride. He has to get the last word in. There are times yes. he shouldn't have been talking to Hans, but he was. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, because he's a prideful character. Yeah. Um, he's got a sense of humor. He always feels he's right. And to the point where, and that's one of the reasons why he has problems with his wife. Um, and to the point where his wife is like, there's a nice line later on where he's like, where like the, one of the bad guys is just pissed off and he's hitting things. And he's like, well, and then one of the characters is like, oh, well, that guy, oh, he's angry. And he's like, oh, my husband's still alive. Because yes. can make someone that angry. That's why I feel like he's, he's like a traditional man. Like if, if this move was set in South Africa, he probably could have been a Zulu guy or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, like a traditional. I won't bend to the modern. Oh thing. my god! I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. Like this whole thing I of you being. Saying, yeah, uh, this whole thing of you being like a corporate. A woman is a man is. Yes, because you because that. <laughs> because if you listen to that conversation between him and the wife, uh, he says something like. This is not the, 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 the idea of a marriage that I... It's what she says. She says, this is, just, this is not your idea of a marriage. And then he says, what do you know about my idea of marriage? And she's like, no, I know exactly what idea of marriage that you want. You yeah. know what I mean? So that line for me says that he is very rigid in his ways. Like he, he, he has a very old... But well, he would have tried to fight for the kids, but he didn't. He ended up he ends up fighting for his wife instead, actually. So I feel like that's unique as well. Right. No, he, the kids leave with the wife. Right. And, right. and no, offense to, no offense to the Zulus. I'm sure they understand what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> I no, hope definitely. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Dog, you know what? Cause fights. It's beautiful. We need more attention. <laughs> thing is bad for us. Uh. One of the things that also is thing, though, even though he has got pride, especially in the moment, right? As soon as she leaves, right, someone comes in and calls her out. He immediately beats her, he beats himself over because he knows he's fucked up. Yes. He knows that was a good moment for them to have a, to have yes. to like fund. And, and he, he, he must it up with his ego. Right. But he doesn't get a chance to recover because... That's the last minutes, time he sees his wife throughout the whole movie, right? Well, yeah, until the end, basically. Yeah, he yes. misses her throughout all of Act 2. Yes. Act Um uh, 17 minutes in, the music takes that same turn as the truck goes underground and a car comes in. Two men exit the car and shoot the security guard with a silenced pistol and infiltrate the building. The attack has begun. Um, as a that team black guy is overacting. I didn't realize how much that black guy overacts in this movie until Who? today. <laughs> Which guy? Uh, the IT guy. The. Oh yeah, he's just having a great time. Yes. The tech the genius. IT guy is having a great time. He's out here. Just like the bang, ah, two points. It's just, it's <laughs> and to be fair, Hans is having a great time too. A lot of them are having fun in the beginning anyway, before things yes. get real. Yes. Um, and that's something I mentioned that, yeah, the building is a high-tech, me- the, the high-tech megastructure of this building is shut down. Um, the cut, By the way, all the time the cuts have been, sh- when the sh- things go down, the cuts have been sharp, um, movement sufficient, and done with a confidence, with a sense of fun. Um, mm. Like they've been doing this a thousand times. Do you know what yeah. I mean? To them, it's like, just a Tuesday. Yeah, exactly. And that, ironically, gives it a... If their laziness gives them a sense of control. Mm. That, yeah, they've been doing this forever. This, these are pros. Yeah. It's kind of funny. It should be the opposite, but it's not. It works perfectly. Right. Um, the confident shows that they're pros, and they're going through the plan without a word said. Then, finally, their party is attacked. No time to even put on a pair of shoes. John takes off. He's tense and trying to call for help, but the phone lines are cut. Alan Rickman does his thing as an awesome speaker and declares his his political need to teach them a lesson, and talks about um talks about um Tagaki. Kashi's Tagaki. main life, entire Tagaki. life goes over every detail. It's fuck, it's amazing actually. Right. Um, it's so like good. His entire resume, bro. Yeah. Is, yeah. Five kids, 
so and so into this high school, into this college, so and so. Yeah. Um, I, Alan Rickman is so good, I could listen to that man read a phone book. Um, <laughs> 27 minutes in, um, moving from floor to floor, we see the size of the operation. Um, Taka Takami is being interrogated. At first, we think it's about terrorism from based on the earlier speech, but it turns out to be about a $640 million in bonds. Yes. Um, um, he's not helpful, so he gets killed. Um, John exposes himself while getting while shocked about the whole thing and that's to get away. Mm -hmm. um, 34 minutes in, we're presented by our bad guy's mission, the big safe. Just this massive metal slab. It's pretty cool. Um, John comes up with a plan. He sets up a fire alarm. But the bad guys manage to call a false alarm. But now they know his whereabouts. So they come after, So someone comes after him. Right. Um, it's one of the two blonde brothers. Which they set up very nicely. Without actually having to say anything. Like mm -hmm. when the thing which he's cutting the cables. The other guys try and cut things. Yeah, he's cables. trying to stop him from saying yeah. no. But here's the thing though. Mm -hmm. Are those guys Dutch? Yeah. Or German, something like that, yeah. But I think they're Dutch, because... Oh, you're Africans, yeah. didn't you? you it sounds Africans. like Africans, yes. yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm asking if it sounds if it's Dutch, because it really sounds like Afrikaans. Hey, dog. I feel like Dutch and... no, What's it? Norwegian and German are basically like Afrika are like are like um, Zulu and Kosa. Yeah. Or Bailey and Zwana, I think, yeah. I'm with you on that one, yeah. Definitely. I think it's kind of like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I like that whole setup because again they set up with that whole with that little stunt that they were doing where he has to cut the cables quickly while thinking again. You can tell, okay, these guys have a special bond with each other. Yes. All yes. without saying words. Anyway. Um set up the file arm. Okay, cool. Comes after him and it becomes it becomes a game of cat and mouse, right? Mm -hmm. Um cool. Now it's John, a New York cop versus a terrorist. This is an opportunity for a well-designed fight, right? Right. Um, but they do not go that way. Why? Because it's an 80s movie. And here's the funny thing about 80s movies. Outside of martial arts movies, um, I would argue the fights then have not reached the level that of fights now. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's basically like watching Godzilla. Um, because they're all strong. They all tussle each other like, ah, ah, eh, psh, yeah. ah, 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 eh, psh. Do you right. know what I mean? Right. Basically, and then they wind up a fist from, like, from the shoelace level and they send it over to the guy's head and he's like, <laughs> and then, then he falls yes. over something. It's almost a bit... Um... It's literally Godzilla. Like if you watch an old school Godzilla fight, <laughs> it's Godzilla. <laughs> it's as if there's no fight choreography as yeah, whatsoever. exactly. It's like the director's just telling them, okay, I think what you should do is this. Yeah, just hit him like that. And then just, yeah. meanwhile, but you can tell from the shots that they've clearly planned this because they'll be like, they're going through things Cameras already there, and they go through yes. it like that. So yeah. you can tell it's set up. It's been corrupted. Yeah. But and sometimes you can see that uh, um, a stuntman was was oh. in Bruce Willis's. Let uh... me get me started on that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's yeah. like those old school Jackie Chan movies. Whenever there was like a white guy involved in the movie, especially Who Am I? Oh yeah. my God! There's a perfect example there. The final kick when the yeah. bad guy gets kicked. Right. He's like an old white man, right, with like slick hair. Yeah. Then suddenly his hair is long and black. He's 100% <laughs> Asian. He's about a foot shorter. He gets kicked. And then suddenly the white guy, old white man, lands on the floor. He's like, oh, oh I've been hit. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. the level of stunt work and action in the 80s. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to just, yeah. Anyway, they, anyway they, they, they do the whole Godzilla thing. They fall down a flight of stairs. And the one guy breaks his neck. Yeah. Um, but... but the 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 smack that uh, John McClane speaks when he's killing, he's gonna kill you. I'm like, yo, why are you making it seem? Like, you know, it's like um, when you hear people fighting in the street. Yeah, that's the smack they talk about. You know, like when you're busy smacking someone, but you're gonna tell, you're telling them what you're gonna do to them. Yeah. <laughs> that's what yeah. John McClane was doing. And I think they did that on purpose. I think they wanted to make John an everyman. They wanted to yes. make John as normal as possible. They did not want to make him. You have got a special set of skills. Nah, that's you have a special set of skills. That's the difference between this movie and the fifth movie. Yes. Because the fifth movie is trying too hard to make John a superhero. And oh, that's, yeah. he's never been a super. He's yep. just a guy who panics mm -hmm. in situations that are way above his pay grade. And he just finds ways. He's like a MacGyver. 
Yeah. And he finds a way to to make it work. And I think that's what makes, I mean, he's sweating. You know what I mean? <laughs> but anyway. Don't forget, there's also an element of, um, I think you talk about competence porn, but this is the thing we discussed last week about um, Naruto, Ichigo, and Tina Fey, basically, where there's a level, where there's a simplicity to them, but not an incompetence. Because again, there's a clever moment, a very clever moment that John does in the next scene. Mm. Where um, he drops the, he ties the body up, says, and now I've got a machine gun. Ho, 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 right? Right. While he's doing that, right? Okay, first of all, that's pure ego, right? Mm-hmm. But he's on the lift as well, and he's listening to them talk as he yes. takes down their names mm-hmm. to try and use that against them. Right. So, yes, he's a simple everyman, but he is actually doing things, making moves to try and get an advantage wherever he can. Trying to get into. Yes. Yeah, which he could easily um, tell the cops if he needs backup. You know what I mean? He's getting enough information without actually being exposed to the bad guys. He's not out there, I'm going to beat you guys up and accidentally get something. Nah, exactly. Exactly my point. He's doing everything I can to make a move. I think there's something the director does here that stands out. It's a bunch of small cut-ins. A focus on the small stuff that comes together to make a nice whole image. Mm. He's no perfectionist. John McTiernan is not a perfectionist, as we've discussed with the whole stuntman thing. Yes. He's by no means a perfectionist. Right. But he's more active. So what I think is, instead of him being like a surgical knife, like let's say, for example, David Fincher is a surgical knife, mm. um, I would say uh, McTiernan is more like a machine gun. <laughs> he's mm. such a... Think about all those cuts we saw. Um, think about all those angles we saw. This man, Arche, and then what happens is it gets put together in the editing room. This is a movie that is, they cut a lot of pieces, and then the editor comes in with a broom, and then some sort of sewing needle, and puts that stuff together mm-hmm. to make this movie. Right. That's what this is about. Like, we know we always talk about directors. Mm-hmm. Like, if there was ever a movie we need to, where we probably should start talking about editors, it would be this movie, I think. This is a perfect mm-hmm. example of a movie right. that was cut together. Because some of these flows, if you actually pay attention to them, I think I've noticed now, after watching movies so many times, some of it is almost illogical. If that makes yes. sense. Yes. But you don't notice it because there's momentum. Okay, this side goes from this side. He's moving this way. Goes from this side. He's moving this way. Can this you give an example of, the, of yeah. the illogical moments that you witnessed? Um, okay. The flow of the... Okay, it's a bit later on. But... Um, He's being chased, and the, the, the brother's chasing him down, firing the machine gun. He's going down the escalator. He's going down that little vent, and he goes in the thing, right? Um, the, the timing involved there, where like, he shoots at the, the guys that are on the other side. If you look at that full flow, from him getting from one side to one side to one side, the timing almost doesn't make sense. Yeah. Off. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to watch it 50 times to ever notice, because when you're watching it, it doesn't matter, because you understand what's happening. You're enjoying the moment, yeah. Not, not just, yes, yes, you are enjoying the moment, but it's telling you exactly what's happening. It's skipping the lines, skipping, mm. skipping. You don't need to see this, you don't need to see this, you don't need to see this, you don't need to see this. So the guy, the editor doesn't try to show it. Um, apparently there's a DVD version of this movie, right? Where where you actually get to be the editor. Um, so what happens is, because again, you know, every movie has multiple takes. Yes. So um, what you get to do is you get to look at the different takes and you get to see, um, someone made a YouTube video about it. And there's a cut where you get to see um, Mr. Tagami getting shot, right? And Mm -hmm. you get to see John's reaction. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's a cut where you get to pick those different things. And you can see when you look at the different cuts, why the editor picked the cut that he picked. Because uh, Mr. Tagami doesn't look good when he's getting shot, first of all. Um, So you just see the blood splatter. Such a good idea. Works perfectly. Yeah. so instead of there being a stuntman, because remember, when a, skill, when a squib glow goes off, it hurts. So I'm assuming what they did was like, okay, let's not hurt the actor. Let's get a stuntman. Yeah. Then when the squid goes off, it'll be go off on his head and it's fine. Right. right. So, you know, the stuntman will take a hit. So I think that's what happened there. So they do things like that. And then there's also another one where it took three takes of, you know, when he's like in the in the vents, right? And, and then the it's like, the, yes, the like oh, let's go to the coast, have a few laughs. <laughs> They show multiple cuts of that one. If I ever find the link, I'll send you the video. It's fantastic. So this thing was basically saved in the editing room, I think. Oh. I feel like there was every example was this movie. Because right. what happens is, again, point the gun, hear the gunshot, see the blood splatter, 
oh, someone's head got blown off. You know that. I know that. Um, if they can't do the scene, doesn't matter they can't do the scene. Mm. Because we've got the pieces that come together for you to see what happens. Right. This is editing 101, right? This is editing 1000, not even 101. This right. is editing 1000 at a, at a high level. Right. Um, Scorsese talks about editing as well. There's a lot of directors that talk about editing. But yeah, cool. Just thought you should know that. That's um, really interesting. I don't want to lie. Um, yeah. I didn't even know that. Honestly, I didn't. Yeah. Um, for example, George Lucas's wife, apparently she was the editor. Um, and they talk about her as well, how there was stuff that George Lee wanted in and she was like, no, you can't put this in. Um, it won't look good or something like that. And oh, then she oh, helped cut up the movie. Was movie. First one, yes. Okay. So she helped cut up the movie and they saved the movie in the edits, basically, is the idea. The beautiful movie we have is thanks to the editing room. You know, I think what most people don't understand about... Some of the best peoples uh, that we know, uh, like the the contributions their wives made. Mm. Um, I think Benz, if it wasn't for his wife, the the first car wouldn't have been made. Um, Akira Toriyama, the Kamehameha, wouldn't exist. Um, well, he wouldn't have called it the Kamehameha. Oh, really? What happened? I think he wanted to call it someone something else, and then his wife suggested the Kamehameha. Yeah, it's the same story with Walt Disney. He wanted to call Mickey Mouse Mortimer. The wife said, call, her, call him Mickey. You know, so some of these people, their wives have really contributed a lot to what Absolutely. we know and love. Yeah, exactly. Said, hey, same thing. The wife said, why don't you just do something you love? And then that's when Spider-Man came out. Yeah. Or Fantastic Four, one of the two. Yeah, so. Because that's what, yeah, that's, that's what having a good person behind you is like, man. Yeah. I could talk for hours about that, but yeah. <laughs> um, right. Cool. Anyway, John calls, remember, John's a cop, right? So he would know the frequencies of these radios for police. Yeah. So he uses a walkie-talkie to call for cops um, directly on a, a, a CBS line. I think that's what it's called. I think it's CBS, but anyway, um, a line, and he calls for help. Um, we get our California cop. His, um, his opening being being looked down on by the cashier, but he doesn't care. No, he doesn't care. Yeah, he doesn't care. He's just having a jolly Christmas. Because, okay, uh, so before you get there, I just want to say that, okay, McLean goes to the roof because, yeah, like you were saying, the frequency, there was no sig signal. The best way to get signal was on the roof. He gets yeah. the signal, makes a distress call, finally reaches someone, they think he's bluffing, um, but eventually they take him seriously, then the radio... Uh, to someone who's um, who's nearby, it happens to be Reginald Von Johnson, who's currently buying what Twinkies. I don't know what to call those things. They're not Twinkies. They're not donuts. I don't know what they are. Then the cashier is like, "Yo, um, are you gonna have all those by yourself or something like that?" It's like so no. I thought cops only eat donuts. And yeah, they only. <laughs> and then they just look at him. And like, like she's pregnant. And they just look at him. It's like, yeah, sure, buddy. <laughs> Of course, buddy. You know what I mean? Like, sure, it's for your wife. Yeah, sure, buddy. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. And uh, he doesn't care. Gets out, gets this the, the call, heads out, and then, yeah. We realize that... Yeah. The yeah. There's so a nice little moment here where he's looking at the building, mm -hmm. and from a distance, it all seems well. Meanwhile, yeah. at that exact second, there's a massive gunfight. Dude. And, and John's running for his life. Yes. Um, again, like I said, a lot of this movie is made from the editing room. There's lots of, there's many angles, many, many cuts. Um, and all of them stick together to make a solid set of momentum. Right. Um, John's being chased uh, into a hole and he's stuck. This is perfect for the bad guys who have to deal with the cops who are coming. But with the brother storyline um, that comes into play as, as orders are dis disobeyed by the emotions of the story. Right. So now the brother's still coming after him. Um, John is trapped but manages to escape by luck as Sir Sergeant Powell appears. Um, now, what's clever is that they have already shut down one warning attempt. And now it looks like a second warning attempt is about to fail. All the while, another attempt to get attention has led to John, John, John sacrificing his position. Every time he calls for help, he sacrifices his position. He ends up losing yes. out. Yes. Uh, it turns out she's relevant because it tells something about who he is. You know what I mean? He'd rather help. Then, um, yeah. He survives. Which tells what? About who he is. Kind of like um, that he'd rather, he's self-sacrificial. 
He wants to help people. He genuinely mm. wants to help people. Yeah. Even if it's, yeah. It's a character moment for him. Cool. And every single time he does, he gets punished for it. Because sometimes what happens is these movies, especially modern movies, my God, they're like, do you have a moment where it's like, oh, I'm going to sacrifice myself. And then it's like, oh, no, it's fine, dude. You're, you're fine. You're, you're fine. It turns out you weren't sacrificing much of anything. So this <laughs> nice moment. Right. Where, yes, it turns out, no, he was actually sacrificing a bit of himself there. And he nearly dies, but he survives. Mm. Um, and Paul is about to bounce when the corpse of the ones trying to kill him lands in the car and everyone opens fire. Like, it's chaos. And, G- and Reginald is like... Jesus H Christ! Yeah, I think we're skipping a part where I just wanted to. Talk. So original goes to the building. Mm-hmm. Uh, he meets one of the goons, thinking that one of the goons is actually the receptionist. Uh, he's like, "Yo, okay, like he says, like everything is fine. There's nothing wrong. The person is chilled." He says, "Let me just go search the area." He searches a bit, and just before he gets a bit further, where he could have landed, where he could have gotten killed because someone was actually. He's like, ah, you know what, enough of this, I'm fine. Gets out, um, takes his walkie-talkie and uh, tells them that, look, it was just a, what's this, maybe it was a prank call or something. Yeah, it was a prank. They were under the impression it was a prank. Yes. Never believed, yeah. As he was leaving, John is like, okay, clearly the chair that I was trying to throw out is not going to work. Yes. Throws a whole dead body on this car. (laughs) Lends on this car. Exactly, you get one of the most classic lines of all time. Welcome to the party, pal. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> right, and uh, he reverses. Mm-hmm. You know, I think what I like about this movie is, and I think you and I have spoken this, about this before, there's certain action sequences that happen that are not hand-to-hand combat, but it's still action nonetheless. Oh, yes. Because Reginald actually reversing, mm-hmm. there was something else, eh? Like, he could have died for the most part. Okay. But um, he didn't. And even how the, the car landed, you know, on its back like that. Yeah. He could have, had a, he could have died, but he didn't. He could have fallen apart right there. That's his action throughout the movie. <laughs> how him just trying to deal with the captain is already his own action story right there. 100%. Um, cool. So we see, we cut to a guy talking on the radio when he hears a police dispatch. And we get a nice little focus transition. Um, it's a nice, yeah, it's nice to see. It's a nice shot to see how big things are about to get right before we see the cops sitting up and Hans settling down, setting down his troops who are upset. Mm. Only for John to make himself known and uses their names against them, freaking his troops out. We get that. Then, as they're talking, we get the classic Yipika Ye line as well. Yes. Uh, they kind of get to kind of suss each other out, basically. Like the basic, this is basically the origin of, mm. like that's how we started getting why yes. it's Zipika, yeah, because it's like, oh, you think you're a cowboy, you think you're like this, uh, John Wayne, John Wayne or something. Yeah. He says, I'm more into Roy Rogers and something like that, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Cool. Um, what, now we're at the one hour mark. Um, in cuts the news broadcast, news broadcaster as he's warning everyone about, about this big story and its opportunity. You can tell this guy's ambitious, egotistic, mm. sleazy. He's trying to prove a point. He's like a male version of Lois Lane, basically. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, the, the, the dynamic has changed. The cops are here, and we've t- and they're taking over the perimeter. It's all been. It's all been before. All that's been before was fighting games with the whole cat and mouse stuff. Right. Now we're at the midpoint, and whereas before we've talked about midpoint lows, mm-hmm. this is the midpoint high. How uh, so? Huh? How so? Um, because we think everything's because it's a, everything's going to be fine. We can now relax. The big boys are here. Daddy's home. Right. The cops are here. Um, yeah. Uh, everything's going to be fine. Daddy's home. And, al- and alarmingly, John's wife suddenly appears into the scene and turns out to be the most senior position, person in the room now that um, Taga, Taga is dead. Yes. Um, and she leads our situation. This is a nice moment to show why the pair are in love, in my opinion. Because mm-hmm. she's strong. Because yeah. she's a very strong character. Yeah. She's yeah. headstrong. She's got ego, man. She's yeah. a person with a gun to your face and you're still talking smack. Dude. I don't want to be here. Are, are you crazy? Yeah. But yeah, we are a man. Because he's like, he's like, who put you in charge? <laughs> you and did. She's like, you, after you killed our boss, Takaki. Yeah. Like, oh, okay, so what are your demands? Look, the, the guys need... Uh, I have a pregnant woman. 
Mm-hmm. So we need to put her in another room, in another floor that has a, a sofa so that she can obviously be more comfortable yeah. for her back. He's like, okay, no, I'll bring the sofa to you. That's fine. Yeah. It's like, okay, then you're going to get a whole, a lot of, um, you're going to get a mess on the floor if you don't allow people to get bathroom breaks. Yes. It's like, okay, cool. Then we'll make that happen. Anything else? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, so. exactly. It's a nice moment. Uh, these these moments are more awesome because these moments come together to form a truly artistic vision, basically. Right. Um, whereas sometimes you'll focus on um, what's the director's name again? The one um, the one that did Blow Out. What's his name again? Uh, Brian De Palma. Yeah, De Palma. Sometimes the visuals are um will be so beautiful they'll be almost distracting, especially sometimes in Blow Out, like that Jesus one. That was just unnecessary. Um, Jesus? With the Jesus visual. You know what I'm talking about? Where he's like on the bed when that guy's like on the bed, he's like kind of looks like oh, a cross in yes, it. Yes. Yeah, it's like man's like a painting almost. Right. Like, okay, that's beautiful, but okay. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Right. Uh, De Palma, I mean, sorry, the return is the opposite. There's, can you think of a single shot right now, like besides that one blur shot that I can think of, that's all I can think of, where you're like, wow, what a shot. No. Yeah, no, of course not. Yeah. He's, he's, he's so business like. He's t- here to tell you a story and give you a specific set of emotions. 100%. He's, he's like a mechanic. If, he, if, if, if um, De Palma's a painter, he's a mechanic. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? He just wants to get the job done. That's yeah, he's out here making sure the story runs smooth. But, you know, I, to be honest, I, I, I would really th- shake the writer's hand because these are moments that other writers usually forget to include in their work. Normally, a movie like this would just purely focus on the action. Yeah. Right? But in this movie, you have moments where you need to think about the hostages and what they're going through. Include that in the story. How do you include that? Okay, who's in charge? It's John's wife. Okay, what would she say in this particular situation if she was in the same room with Hans? This is the situation. People need bathroom breaks. There's a pregnant lady. She needs to get a sofa. So, that's the realism of it. If a pregnant woman is watching this movie and she heard that line, she would be like, yeah, she needs a sofa. You know what I'm saying? Because she feels like at least if I was in that situation, I would definitely need my back to rest. Yeah. And, you know, so I think Aaron Sokin would be proud of that. Those are the some of the... Well, he'd have turned it into a speech that's five pages long. <laughs> but I hear what you're saying. Um, yeah. But I would also add that um, there's also, um, it's not just that, it's about heart. Like, for example, let's think about the diehard wannabes. White House down. Yeah. This scene wouldn't have been here. Do you know what I mean? Like, Skysc- Oh, it wouldn't have made sense. Skyscraper. Uh, skyscraper. Yeah, that's the one with, with The Rock, right? Yeah. I was literally going to say that one next. <laughs> with, with buff man McRock pants. I was just <laughs> being like, I lost my leg. Shut up. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Right. Like, the tension comes from the building burning down in Skyscraper, right? Mm. For us, the tension comes from us being like, oh shit, there's a moment where we realize, oh shit, we're in her room, we're in her office right now. Yes. And you see um, the painting, the, the picture that got put down. Mm-hmm. You see that being put down and you realize, oh my God, it's, that's the only reason John McKen is not dead right now. Right. That, that painting is down right. instead of up. And uh, all these things come together as opposed to buff man McRock pants. Um, do you know <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> buff man McRock pants. Right. Dog, it just... This is why The Rock is struggling, man. There are all these little pieces coming together right here. Mm. Skyscraper didn't do any of this. Right. You know, there's something that I want to mention. Mm-hmm. There's a part of... Uh, original Van Johnson meets the captain of the LAPD. Is it the LAPD? Yes, um, deputy chief, yeah. And uh, they're trying to figure out what's going on. Who are you talking to over the phone? He explains that he has a feeling that he's talking to a cop. It's like, what do you know? It's like it's a hunch. It's like, dude, what makes you think it's a it's 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 a cop? It's it's probably it, 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 uh, why? It's like oh, because of the fake ID. He was able to see the fake IDs. It's like he could have been a bartender. Yeah, that I think was an inside joke because before Bruce Willis started acting, he was a bartender. Oh, I so didn't I know that. That was deliberate. 
or not. Okay, I like that. That was very smart. Yeah, I like that. That's a nice moment. Yeah. That's a nice, I like that, definitely. But again, you see the difference between this and Skyscraper, though. And it was, I haven't, well, funny enough, I haven't watched Skyscraper, man. Oh, okay, well, don't worry, you missed nothing. Okay, what about White House <laughs> Down? <laughs> but I could, I, love... the post, I could see by the post of Skyscraper, I'm like, wow, this is die hard, really? Yeah. I bet it does, and it's not even as fun as like the Meg. See, like you know, there was that oh. period where like you know these Chinese movies were trying to like get Hollywood actors to join in. Yes, that's basically what Skyscraper and the Meg were. Um, the only difference is the Meg was kind of having fun. <laughs> Didn't take itself too seriously. Right. Whereas Skyscraper tried to, and it just didn't work out. It just wasn't. Yeah. Sheesh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like you should do a movie where we compare these two movies over. <laughs> uh, I'll just find three diehard movies, three diehard clones, and then watch them watch them together. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, yeah, cool. It's it's a moment that Hans misses, and so far it lets us breathe a sigh of relief. Mm. It reminds us of the stakes. Right. You know what I mean? Right. This could go very wrong. Yes. Yeah. We get Thornburg, the report, reporting the situation, mm-hmm. um, and Argon is still stuck in the limo. We're just getting all these pieces. They're reminding us all these chess pieces right now. All right. lasting a split second. Um, the bad guys get their moment to flex their muscles now. Um, this lasts eight minutes as the cops try to come in. Um, and yeah, the bad guys shut that shit down aggressively. Um, and they are taken down. By the way, yeah, John has been a passive character for these last eight minutes. He's just kind of been a passive. Yeah, I mean, what could he do, though? You know, there was not much he could do at this point. Exactly. exactly. So now um, the the rescue that he was hoping for falls apart. Mm-hmm. So that high point that we had, down. Because uh, nobody's listening to what Al is saying. Because, yeah. hey, I'm your superior. I know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So. Yep. Police. Yeah, it's it's interesting thing about police incompetence. Um, because, yeah, police incompetence, and then you get police competence. But that I think happens a is, lot in movies, eh? Huh? Like, that happens a lot in movies. But. Yeah. And I think what it is, it's, it's them saying, it's, it's, the middle, it's the middle management syndrome. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Yes. Where, um, I haven't heard of it, but what you're saying, I think I, I, I get what you're going to say. Now. Yeah, basically it's the idea of the, the you get the hard, the actual guy who does the work. It's all those memes of the, like, a good manager says push and he's pushing with the people and a bad manager says push and he's on the thing yelling mm-hmm. push mm-hmm. and that's kind of what's happening here mm-hmm. or um yeah it's a whole middle management thing with these like people who think they're in charge but they don't really are not useful in anything yeah yeah they just have a position a good a position that they have the position but they don't really have the skill exactly yeah they're out here being like joffrey from game of thrones or um yes Oh, what's the face the young yeah. child? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's what it's all about. Um, obviously, it's like, well, you wouldn't call it class. I guess you call it hierarchy, not class. Right. Yeah, right. but um, cool. So John McCain finally becomes active again, using the detonators and C4 that he got in before, blowing mm-hmm. up an entire floor and destroying one of the lifts. Um, the but here's the thing that I don't get, man. And you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but. It actually popped in my head now while we're talking, not when I was watching the movie. Are you telling me that the limo driver didn't hear that explo- that explosion? <laughs> yes, yeah, he heard the news. Yeah. Maybe he didn't hear the gunshots. That's fine. Yeah, cause... the gunshots he didn't hear. The explosion yeah. he'd already saw and seen everything that's in the news. The news report had already happened. Oh, okay. So the explosion happened after the news report. But I agree that this this idiot out here playing his music so loud. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, we get a moment, yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Um, yeah, he becomes active again, blows up thing. The devastation is incredible. And here's what I was talking about before about reactions. Mm-hmm. Um, this man dedicates like a minute, almost a minute, of just us seeing people's faces after the explosion. Right. He's, everyone's like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. And different people, it has different meanings to them because none of them know what the full situation is. Yes. Um, so it just means different things and it's chaos. Yeah. Because uh, um, someone goes to Hans is like, I think the police are, no, you idiot. Yeah, it's the police. It's him. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. I absolutely love it. Um, things are out of control. Um, what power was there is gone. Um, the bad guys have been put on pause in things, but John has slowed, because John has slowed them down. But the bad guys are still in control. This is very important to the flow of the story, because um, um, there's been, there's no, there hasn't actually been a win on the good guy's side. The people, people are dead. You know what I mean? Yes. So he slowed things down, but people are dead. There's no win yet. He's just stalling, basically. Like, yes. I think his initial plan was to stall mm-hmm. until the police arrive, hoping that the police will do their good, their job properly. Yeah. But he realizes as he keeps killing people, because from 12 to 7 people, he's slowly realizing that he needs to be the one that's taking them out. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I like to call it the Kang the Conqueror problem. With a lot of these TV shows sometimes, what happens is they'll, when they, there's a moment where they get like a small, not a win, but like a positive moment, and then it's too positive a moment. Like with Kang the Conqueror, I don't know if you've seen Loki, the TV show. I have. It's fantastic, right? Masterpiece. Mm. Um, then of course you get Ant Man, which is nowhere close. Um, mm. But funny enough, mm-hmm. Jonathan Majors is not the problem in Ant Man. Yes, not at all. He's the best yeah. part. Yeah. Samuel Loki is the best part. I think we should we should uh, do a review of, of that movie. But yeah, let's yeah. go. It'll be a it'll be a massacre. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, my point is, it's the Kang Conqueror problem is very closely tied to the Wolf problem. In that, um, how are you going to set up something that's supposed to be big and bad when it keeps losing? Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's like, why are we afraid of this guy? Yeah. So even though John McClane has killed, like, what? Four bad guys, five bad guys at this point, including mm. in the explosion. Mm. But um, still under pressure, still in danger. Yes. No momentum lost, no momentum won. Right. Do you know what I mean? Right. And I think a lot of movies make that mistake sometimes, where they, they give the good guy almost too many wins. Mm, mm, yeah. And I so think I, that's why Dragon Ball Z made this very, very interesting during the Namek saga, where, <laughs> yes, Goku just beat some of the Ginyu Force members. Oh, yes. But you're like, dude, Frieza is nothing compared to these guys. If you think you will, you will win against Frieza, yeah. you have another thing coming. Exactly. Yeah. And don't forget they had to they had to first and even before then they still nerfed Goku because they first had him injured by Captain Ginyu first. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Before they set him up for Freezer. Like he came later. Everyone else had to face Freezer first. It's exactly. it's nice. Ironically though, Dragon Ball Z ends up being a victim to that because yes. they end up winning so many fights and they have to yes. keep upping the ante. Yes. 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 Oh, okay, this guy can destroy planets, this guy can destroy solar systems, this guy can destroy galaxies, that guy can destroy the universe. Yes. Okay, calm down, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean, but yeah. Yes. So I like this moment. In the fact, that, yeah, I still like this moment very well. Anyway, um, we cut to Hans and the sleazy Ellis, who tries to negotiate the situation, um, dropping a mother of a gift on the bad guy's lap. While that disaster is happening, we get John and Powell going over... Um, um, having a moment only to be interrupted by Hans who now officially knows who John is um, things are getting worse he tries to save Ellis but but Ellis ends up being blown away you know, Ellis, Ellis made things worse dog, he made things so much worse he was necessary to the plot because had he not intervened or had he not tried to negotiate mm-hmm. the stakes wouldn't have gotten higher yeah um because now Hans knows who he was talking to all along. Yeah. Now the cowboy has a name. It's John. Yeah. But uh, again, chess piece. I agree it's plot relevant, but it's story accurate. A guy like Ellis, who even in front of the big boss can't shut up, would think he's better than a bunch of terrorists. Yes. It's justified. It flows with the storyline. The fact that he, he was sniffing drugs and McLean saw him and then he didn't even panic. Yep. Tells you all you need to know about Ellis. Exactly. Yeah. You so, know, when I was young, I couldn't tell the difference between Hans and Ellis because they, they both had beers. <laughs> that's a hate crime. That's so racist. <laughs> I, was, I was a kid, man, but now I'm like, oh. I'm joking, man. <laughs> but yeah, um, Hans sets up a little wild goose chase for the cops. 
saying, hey, guys, I'll, you have to rescue, you have to liberate all these people, just making up names, basically. Right. Um, but finally, the FBI, who Hans has been waiting for, arrive. Johnson & Johnson. Whether it's the vaccine or the baby powder, it's up to you. We have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the two. <laughs> yep. Um, Hans is going over his explosions when he's met by John and plays... Um, and then he immediately tries to play an American and gives off a great show of him. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Uh, you're, you're one, one of them, them, aren't you? You're I one of them. them. You're one of them. You're going to kill me. You're going to yes, kill one of them. I love it so much, dude. Like, calm down. Calm down. I'm not going to so kill much. you. <laughs> yep. oh. But there's a scene I never noticed until now, actually. <laughs> right. I, I'm so... This man is such a good director. He does things efficient. And I think, again, De Palma would have done it more artistically, but he does it so efficiently. Where um, Him and Hans are chilling, right? He offers Hans a cigarette. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like, so, what's your name? And behind him is a list of all the office floors yes. with the names of all the people in the offices, right? Yes. And then this man says, my name is Bill so-and-so. It's Clay. And Bill Clay, yes. But yeah. because Hans has clearly been evaluating the building up and down, nonstop. Mm. He knows all the people's names. So he's managed to guess his, So he managed to, so it's a little thing, a test for John. But obviously Hans wins it because he's been doing his research for a long ass time. Right. Yeah. So it's a little test, but Hans is too clever for it. But John, John gives him another test and gives him a gun. Yes. And then walks away. Yeah. Turns back. Only for things to fall apart when it turns out, nope, um, the gun was empty. Um, because Hans, Hans really basically different. reveals himself now that I'm yeah. not Clay, I'm actually Hans. Exactly. Yeah, and when Hans is shooting at him, it's like, how stupid do you think I am? You know, because when I saw him give him that gun, I'm like, what are you doing, bro? Yeah. But to be fair, though, again, this is working parts, good writing. He gave him a test, he passed, so it makes sense for him to give him a gun. Yes. You know what I mean? So it's not like, oh, John's being an idiot. No, he tested him. Yeah. And obviously Hans, who was almost was was trying to reach for a gun a second ago, mm. the other guns around the corner. Um, he's just like, if I can just get a hold of a weapon. Look, Hans is smarter than McLean. Wait, I mean, but he's more meticulous. I would say that he's more meticulous than McLean. Oh yes, yes. I mean, they're both smart. Yes. Yeah, they're both smart. It's Naruto smart versus um, versus Kakashi smart or um, Shikamaru smart. Yeah. Actually, that's a, that's a good comparison. Yeah, Naruto versus Shikamaru. Uh, like, I think Naruto could, in the moment, without any, like, thing jiggy, could probably outsmart Shikamaru. In the moment, like, something happens in that split second, yeah. Naruto probably do something like that. But okay. give Shikamaru 20 seconds more, and it's over. Yes. <laughs> do you know yeah. what I mean? I wanted, to I wanted to say Naruto versus Neji, but I think it still fits that it's not. Yeah, I think Shikamaru, because again, overall, Hans is so clever. Every plan that he made was going to work completely. Yes. Him blowing up the tower, it would have yes. taken the FBI people with them. Yes. He would have been right. He would have just marched out in, a, in an ambulance and, and he would have left with the money. Which is, which is an idea that was actually, you know what I mean. Which is an, an idea that was actually perfectly executed in Inside Man. Yes, yes. Remember. Yeah, and then they built a section of the wall and they just, they just hid there in the one thing. Yeah, so this was basically but, but the rest of his team yeah. left safely in the buses. Exactly. <laughs> right. With the other people that were they were being kidnapped with. Yes. With Fantastic. With yes. the hostages. Honest to God, one of the one. Yeah, Denzel, man. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. Where they fumbled here, uh, Hunter's team, mm -hmm. is to use their real names. Oh yeah. Yes. Yes, I agree with you there. Actually, I would because next thing you know, everyone knows who it is. Though it is very clever that apparently Hans's alias was already tied to an actual terrorist group. Yes. So I thought that was actually really clever as well. But I agree with you on that one. Um, yeah, cool. Anyway, um, John catches him out and you have to run for his life and another shootout. And the bad guys keep putting him in the spot until finally um, they get what they're looking for. Um, they have what they which are the detonators. They have what they want and John's life is being put at risk. And the thing they set up about John's history takes another blow. Um, we get a heart-to-heart -heart with Powell, which kicks off the final act in the final set piece as, as the power cutting is the last part of the safe cracking, um, allowing the bad guys in. 
Ode to Joy plays out loud, just da, 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 as the doors open. You know, the FBI is like, I bet you they're scared now. Da, 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 the doors open. It was just Not hilarious. knowing that they actually helped them to yep. open the vault. <laughs> yep. It is. And it, it also shows you how smart Hans was. Yeah. Like, yeah. if it wasn't with John, this would be the perfect, just perfect. Um, Ode to Joy, bad guys get their win. Hundreds of millions of dollars. The whole time the movie has had a... F- oh, by the way, there's something I wanted to, we haven't talked about really. Well, we've half talked about. Um, is that the movie's had a fun, a fun element to it. There's been an element of fun to this movie. Even mm-hmm. though it's taking itself seriously, there's been a lot of fun to it. Yes. Um, and obviously, I mean, uh, John McLean's humor played a role here. Played a yes. part in this and this yes. and that. Yeah, his his sarcasm, his ego, yeah. played a huge part. But the actual film as well. For yeah. example, there are multiple juxtapositions mm-hmm. of undermining anything that's being done um, with pride or by official people. Um, the, my favorite example being, uh, by showing the opposite, of course. My favorite example being the terrorists. Uh, remember that shrink guy? They get on the news, they're like, see these terrorists, right? Sometimes what happens is they form a bond with the hostages and then the dead body of Ellis is being dragged away. Yes. Like, <laughs> 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 so things like that. Yeah, exactly. Things like that bond. happen throughout the movie. Right. Or like the part where um, Thornton or whatever his name is, is like, calls the other guy, shut up, you asshole. And then the other guy's in the news and he's about to say something. He's like, you're alive. And he's like, and he's like, trying to talk. Hi, guys. And the camera turns away. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I love that scene, dude. It's hilarious. So things like that have been happening out throughout the entire movie, mm. showing that even though this movie is playing, it's taking, it's, it's playing straight, it's playing itself straight. There's yeah. no winking and nodging at the cameras like modern it's, movies do. Like, uh, you, I know I'm it, in a movie. Yeah. It's gonna fly over your head if you exactly. don't. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And you know me. I hate that whole. Oh, I'm in a movie. You're in a movie. We all know we're in a movie thing. I mm-hmm. hate. That. I hate it as well. But anyway, yeah. So I just thought that was a nice element that's been playing out throughout. Yeah. Um, cool. John is uncovering more clues. Elements are coming together as John investigates why Hans was there in the first place. And he finds all the C4. But he can't say a word because the other brother has finally gotten him. Finally he's been got. Um, and they fight. And of course, again, another classic 80s fight happens. Mm-hmm. No spinning heel kicks. No uppercuts. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, this yeah. is funny. Um, just one hit after the other. It's the most unstylish bull- bullshit in the world. And I kind of miss it. There was a I also miss story. it. You know, when I saw yeah. it, I was like... <coughs> it reminded me of Jean Claude Van Damme movies. The only difference between Bruce Willis and Van Damme is Van Damme would have done a spinning kick yes. or something. But At some point, he'd done the split and we'd have seen his butthole. For yes. Something. I'm not yes. sure why we'd have seen his ass. But he would have. But it reminds me of the 80s movies, man. Yes. And what was so great about 80s movies. Main character bleeding, Mm -hmm. uh, wearing a vest or without a vest, topless, wearing brown pants for some weird reason. Yes. (laughs) With a gun. Yeah. The old (laughs) revolvers. And fighting a foreigner. Yeah. Of some kind. <laughs> no, the big SUVs aren't there. It's that it's the it's the BMW Dolphin. It's the, that old school Mercedes. Right. Like, I swear right. the cars were all big enough for the rest of us to lift. It's <laughs> kind of funny actually, because now that cars have gotten lighter, they've gotten bigger. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Now that they're using what's it called now, fiber carbon or whatever it's called mm. on the casing. Those days, all cars are made out of metal and they're yes. all like small. Now yeah. they're all like these big cars. Right. It's almost like it's a weird juxtaposition. But yeah, I miss those cars, man. The Fiestas and all those old Mercedes. And the, <laughs> right. What were those cars? Yeah. I don't yeah. know. One hit after the other. There's a grunge. The last turn. Um, Hans finds out about Mrs. McLean. This is the last twist, yeah. Um, and things are closing up as hostages are taken to the roof. The money collected. John is beaten down, shot, but wins and chases to get to the roof. He saves the hostages by shooting near them, leading them back down again sacrificing his position again. Um, it's actually done three times now. Mm. Shows who he really is. Yes. He could have just let them, gotten his wife, could have been fine. You know what I mean? Okay. But instead he didn't. He just left them on the roof. Um, so we see Argyle, we cut back to Argyle, and we see that the other guy, the other black guy is um, getting, is about to, is getting away basically. With the money. Uh, yes. 
Um, you kick me cut to John Conf- and Argyle takes his car out and punches him down. It was just it was a nice moment for Argyle. It's for Argyle, yeah. Yeah. I'm, um, I was wondering what the, that reaction could have been had you had you watched it at the theater. Yeah. Think people would have would have laughed. Would have cheered, yeah. definitely. Go Argyle! I, mean, like, yeah. <laughs> I bet you. Yeah. It's like, have you ever watched the Fast and Furious movie on the release day? On the what? Have you ever watched the Fast and Furious movie on the release day? On the release day. On the release day, on the day it comes out. Oh, release day. Uh, never on release day because it usually would be uh, sold out. The tickets would be sold out. Trust but, me when I say, yeah. But I think maybe like second, third day somewhere okay, there. Yeah, that would still count. But I was, okay, I saw that counts, and I'm sure you understand the reactions. Yes. How loud it can get. Yes. Yeah, I feel like that's what would have happened there. If they it's the just... same. It's the same with Black Panther. Mm. Or MCU at its height. It was like oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But it's an old school action movie on opening day. Yeah, I think that would have gotten a good reaction. Yeah. Maybe not Captain America picking up the hammer, not that yeah, big. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but just, the, just the laugh. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, some cheering, maybe even clapping. Yes. Uh, not. <gasps> no, 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 no. I don't know if you. I don't know if you were at the theater when Captain America. I was. Oh. I st- dude, I jumped out of my seat. <laughs> My girlfriend was just sitting there. I jumped out of my seat. <laughs> because, you know, as a comic book fan, you're like, finally, it's happening. Yep. Uh, yeah, but anyway. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I wish I could see Algamation. I wish I could do what I wish I could do is Algamation. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not a comic book fan, but I know what that is. Basically, that's Captain Earth, DC vs. Marvel. It was like a yes. one-time thing. Yeah. Uh, well, you'd have... Superman mm-hmm. and Captain America combined, mm-hmm. like as if as if they if they were to fuse and become one character, right? That's what you mean. No, no, I mean they fought each other. Or oh, when they fight each other. Oh, okay. Yeah, and um, Captain uh, Wonder Woman actually picked up those hammer. Yeah, I mean there's there's a few of those. I mean there's a part where Batman fights Captain America. Mm-hmm. There's another one where Batman fights Hulk. So there's different ones. Yeah. Yeah. It's too bad we don't really get those anymore. Yeah, Marvel, I know Marvel. there were room. I think at a point James Gunn wanted to do something like that, and that would have been interesting actually. If I don't know if I give it to James Gunn, I don't think I give it to James Gunn. Yeah, look, even if you don't give it to him, but I think he would be the one who could make it happen because he worked yeah. in studios. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, but if you had Snyder's cast, where Superman versus. Chris Evans, I'll take that. This is, yeah, this is the the we uh, the Russo brothers' uh, cast, Eesh. like Civil War cast. Yeah, I would give it to the Russo brothers. I wouldn't give it to thing. I would give it to the Russo brothers. They Civil War style. Yeah. Captain America fight. Uh, Captain America versus Batman. Um, Superman versus Thor. Um, yes. Wonder Woman versus. I'm not gonna say Black Widow. No. No hell no. Um, Scarlet Witch maybe. Now Scarlet Witch is power based. I guess Scarlet. I don't. I don't want Scarlet Witch because she's just like one woman's yes. an actual fighter. You want someone who can actually throw punches. Maybe Black Panther. Batman versus Black Panther. Wonder Woman versus Captain America. That's the perfect combo right there. Oh yeah, yeah. That would work for me. Yes. So instead of um, so Batman because Batman and Black Panther are basically the same person. Yes. So yeah, so put them but together. Even Captain Batman, you could say is the same person, but yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. But I feel like it wouldn't be as special as the those two because remember they both they both like I don't say they're both billionaires but yes they both have unless, that unless if it's Winter Soldier versus Wonder Woman um, because he, he doesn't he, pardon I think the connection I talk, when I say connection I mean like the what would they do, what would they say to each other Oh, uh, I get you yeah what would Bucky say to Wonder Woman. Mm. No, you, you have you a point. I, mean? I think Bucky would fight Nightwing, I think. Yes, that's not a bad one, actually. Yeah. Yes, I like that. Spider-Man and Flash would uh, dig it out. Yeah, that would work, because of the spidey sense. Yeah, and the humor. Yes, the humor <laughs> and the spidey sense. Like, like why do you right now? so fast? It's like, yo, did you shoot webs? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're asking each other questions, yeah. Yeah, how do you do it? Well, no, I have this gadget that it allows me to. Oh, flip! Yeah, yeah. And you? Oh, well, I have I'm something. Supposed to be fighting right now. <laughs> yeah. 
exactly. That would exactly. work. Yeah. Um, cool, but yeah, let's not get too distracted. I will, I will, well, that's another hour right there. Yeah, no, that's true. That's, that's another true. hour right there. Yeah. Cool. We need so to having, for that one. If we quickly cut to John confronting Hans, he's beaten down and bloody, but on a mission. John uses tape he saw to, before to strap a gun on his back and gets the gun out to take out Hans. Um, it's a fun, I think we've discussed it before. Um, the reason you get that face that, that um, Alan Rickman pulls is because they let the goal, they say they're going to let go on three, and they're like, one, two, and yeah. you're, <gasps> It was a real reaction. Yeah, like, that was his real face. And, yeah. and I think, uh, it, it's just, oh, I didn't know we talked about it, but yeah, because there's another scene like that is in Pirates of the Caribbean, um, where Elizabeth kisses Jack Sparrow. Uh, Orlando yes. Bloom didn't get the script. Yeah. He didn't get the script there, so his reaction was real. Yep. As well as I think the Goonies, when the kids were witnessing a ship or treasure or something for the first time, it was a real reaction. Yeah. So, yeah, I think okay, that's I, why that reaction is so great because you can see that Ellen is really Patrick for anything. <laughs> Sometimes you can't fake it, bro. Sometimes you can't. Yeah. Fake it. yeah. It's actually that's a funny it. story on TikTok right now. Um, basically, um, what's his name? Um, Scorsese movie, um, DiCaprio, Wolf of Wall Street, yes. Oh, Robbie. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the character, what's the guy's name again? Jordan Belfort. No, 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 no. Um, the actor, the one that plays the friend, the chubby friend. Oh, the one played Hill. by Jonah Hill. Yeah, we go. There's a scene where John Bernathal, you know John Bernathal? Yes, right? the Punisher. Um, Apparently, there's a scene where um, they punch um, him, um, punch um, Jordan Hill, right? Mm. But now they were doing the scene like five times, and it just wasn't looking good for Scorsese. Mm. And Scorsese's like, guys, what if we punch each other for real? <laughs> <laughs> and Jordan Hill's like, this nigga goes to the gym every day. What the hell are you talking about? It's, it's the Punisher. What do you mean? Yeah, <laughs> you exactly. Know? But then the plan, but because it's Scorsese, you don't exactly say no to him, dog. You're trying to win an Oscar here. That, that impersonation was spot on. <laughs> Guys, um, you know what I think? I think we should uh, allow John to punch John. Yeah. That's the perfect uh, way to, uh, for us to get the, the reaction that I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, apparently he let him have it, dog. Like, he really punched him, like, harder than, because apparently, like, Something had happened and Thing Magic was really hyped up and upset. So yeah. he really like <laughs> gave you know what it's like it's it's similar to to Fight Club. Edward Norton actually punched uh, Brad Pitt. That's why after that punch, Brad, the ear, he's, he's like, like dude, why? Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, that would make sense. But yeah. that was a weird punch and his reaction is like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was actually real. It was not nah, that makes sense that that's real. Yeah. The thing is, you can't do everything real, obviously. Yes. But sometimes when you can get away with it, get away with it, I guess. Yeah. I'll never say no. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, cool, cool. Yeah, so um, Hans dies, ending the whole deal. Powell and John meet up for the first time. And this is so funny. Because if you actually look at the reaction between um, John and Powell and the reaction between John and his wife, it is more emotional. Yeah. <laughs> um, the reaction they have is so I, great. I think it's, it's so- because he had so many near-death experiences while Pal was on the other line. Yeah. Uh, that they have a they have an unbreakable they have a bond. Of- yes. Yeah. They have an absolute bond with each other. They're, there's no words spoken. They just look at each other. And they laugh. And they hug each other, dude. Yes. And it's beautiful. This just the wife on the side. Um, they didn't even ask each other who they are. It's like they, oh, they knew. just knew. Yeah. yeah. And to top it off, um, Powell gets his moment of redemption along with McLean as he uses his gun for the first time in a long time. By the way, McLean's moment of redemption is when they have that dark part of the soul section where um John is where um John is giving the goodbye speech where he's like, if I don't make it, please tell yeah. my wife I'm sorry. That yeah. was his moment of redemption. Right. Remember, he said it himself. I can say I love you to my wife a thousand times, but I've never said sorry once. Mm. Because again, he's right. got an ego, and you see it in the movie. It's not right. just something that's said. It's something that's seen, right. but never implicitly explained. Right. That's my favorite kind of writing. It's dangerous <laughs> writing, because sometimes it goes over the audience. Yeah, screen. sometimes you don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. 
But I think it was implicitly shown in this movie. But anyway, yeah. So that was good. The redemption moments. Um, and, and yeah. This you know, movie, it's like with Iron Man. Iron yeah. Man, Tony Stark. Mm-hmm. There's so many things that that man does. Uh, that Robert Downey does as Iron Man. Because remember, he's a billionaire. Yeah. And he's super smart. There's so many things that he says and does that flies on our heads, bro. Like, it's only when you're watching, like, Avengers, like, after 10 years, you're like, oh, flip. So when he said this, this is actually what he meant. And he meant this, he just made a snarky comment. But, oh, man. Like, when uh, under roofs, just that. You know what I mean? Like, there's so many things that, so I, I get what you're saying. Like, there's certain writing that, it's like they're saying, okay, this is guy is smart, but we're not gonna f- shove it down your throat that he's smart. We're just gonna, he's just gonna say certain things, yeah. and if you don't catch them, that means you're not that smart. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like for example, um, a good example of Tony Stark actually is the PTSD, PTSD moment that I love so much. Mm-hmm. It's and after, Iron Man 3. Um, no, not Iron Man Three, um, but but yes, that one as well. But it's after um, Age of Ultron. What was it? I think uh, that's not Iron Man Three. So, no, no, right, it, Age it of Ultron is, is Avengers. Yes. So after Age of Ultron happens, right? It is. It's 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 Captain America: Civil War. Yes. Iron Man is doing a speech, and then this a lady comes up to him after the thing. Mm. And remember, Iron Man doesn't like to be handed every anything at all, right? So he's always like, whenever someone's trying to give something, he's like, no, 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 no. Mm. And then when she tries to do something, she she he freaks out. Do you know what I mean? Yes. He freaks out. Um, and it turns out, no, she's just showing him a picture of the sun. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, so, you see it in the first movie, you see it in the next movie, you see it in Iron Man 3, um, and then the third time, the fourth time, he freaks out upon seeing mm. why? Because he's still got PTSD from, like, Age of Ultron and Iron right. Man 3, basically. Right. So, it's a little... No one says anything. You just you just know. Mm. That's implicit storytelling, in my opinion. That's the height right. uh, of that subtext. But yeah, anyway, um, this movie, like Bridget Jones, is a sum of all parts, but it is a collection of so many elements and parts. There are so many forward moving cuts that should make us laugh, like with the movie Taken. Um, well, you know, remember the fence climbing cut that everyone laughs at in the movie Taken 3? The fence cut? you never seen it, where he's, t- he's climbing a fence and it's like 75 different cuts. Mm-mm. I need to watch Taken 3. Oh, dog, it's just, it's the funniest thing. I wonder if I can show it to you somehow. I should have screen sharing, but I don't know, if, I don't know how it works. I'll figure it out one day. Okay. Um, but anyway, it's like a thing where he's climbing a fence, right? But because obviously, um, um, Leon Nielsen, as much as I love him, he's really old. He's so old, yeah. Tax him jumping a fence is obviously going to look awkward. So they yeah. have to cut it in five different angles and six different <laughs> ways to get him <laughs> over the fence, basically. Right. And it just looks cheap and terrible. Right. Uh, so basically, this is the exact opposite, where it comes together into this perfect flow, basically. Um, it, editing together is put so perfectly, you never notice that the guy who jumps the building explosion is obviously not John McClane. He has long black hair. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, that the tape strapped to his back is way too low for a clean pickup. Like, it's down here. Yeah, dude, like, <laughs> how the hell did he get that? Like, how, could yeah. he... how the hell? How the hell could exactly. he reach? You don't even notice. Yes. You don't even notice. Because but I think that's the thing. I think, I don't know if I spoke to you about this, but back then movies that didn't rely heavily on special effects relied a lot on the story. Yeah. And the performances. The action, yeah. But yeah. but they were not, in as much as they tried their best to be per- perfectionists, Yeah. they made a lot of mistakes, which you could say were still tolerable at the same time. Yeah. David Fincher wouldn't have survived in the 80s. I think he would have he would have had stress every single time he made a movie because people didn't care yeah. enough to It was too expensive. That's why Jack Chan yes. says it's too expensive to shoot a film in Hollywood because Even James Cameron. He yeah. wouldn't have made it like I know he started making he started making movies in the 80s. Mm-hmm. But I think he just barely made it. He just maybe made it when it was fading out, but I don't think he would have survived for the most well, part. Definitely, I think CG saved his life. But also, don't forget, David Fincher is actually a, uses almost as much CG as most people, actually. As most oh, yes, actually. that's true, because of the face thing, no? Not just that. I'm talking about little things. 
he will put CG there. Because again, instead of him doing 50 takes, he can fill up the gap with CG sometimes. Oh. And he'll do that. Actually, no, he'll still do 50 takes because the performance yes. requires 50 takes. <laughs> right. But if there's something he wants to add on or make it perfect, he'll use CG anyway. Mm. And um, he's, he's very good at that. I never actually second guessed yeah. his CG at all, ever since. Yeah. You know the Gone Girl? Mm? No, not Gone. Yeah, no, no, not Gone. Girl's a Dragon Tattoo. Yes has as much CG shots, the same number of CG frames, as the movie Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much of a perfectionist he is. That's crazy. That is crazy. Yeah. But, yeah, definitely. But, yes, I agree with you. What they would do is, it. I call it, I call it the Sasuke method. I, I, now, I know you know Naruto. Yes. For those who don't know Naruto, right, Sasuke has been trying to kill his brother for the longest time, right? Mm-hmm. But his brother says you have to learn a special technique, an yes. eye technique, um, the Mangeko Sherigo, Sheringan, right? Sharingan, yes. Yes. And the special eye technique requires you to kill your best friend. Yes. Um, Sasuke never does that. So instead what he does is he deliberately overpowers all his other moves to make that, to render the one move irrelevant so he can right. overpower it. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So now what happens with a lot of these 80s films, what I think what they did, why they still hold up to this day, Mm-hmm. Is they would do the other things they couldn't do yes way better yes and with so much more energy yes that you don't even think the stuff we've talked about right now this is nitpicking to the highest level 100 you know I mean? yes it's nitpicking to the highest level because the, what they're doing is like this yes but nowadays some of us modern movies are so serialized or so perfect is not the right word they're so what, what can you call it Standard, I guess, is the word. Yeah, it's 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 too much of a, it's too much of showbiz there. It's it's too almost too clean, almost. Yeah, it's too. It's as if every director is pedantic now. It's exactly. like, yeah. It's so clean. They're taking so many shortcuts that it's so clean that you don't even notice it anymore. It's it like, feels like it's done via Chat GPT. I'm sorry to say. Exactly. Yeah. It's like the same way that I can't, you can't, phys- you know how you can technically, you can see your nose all the time. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but because, because you see it all the time, you don't see it anymore. Yes. That's the problem <laughs> that we're having. <laughs> that is a weird ass example. Though. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, right? You, but I get what you're saying. Yes. You see it so often that you don't see it anymore. Yes. And that's one of the problems that, that um, this movie does not have. Like it's this movie holds up today, dude. Like this is great. Yeah, I mean, it does. It, does. Yeah. it reminds me of you know, like I'd put this movie. I know it's not on the same scale, but I'd put it with Speed and Lethal Weapon. Oh, definitely. Because these are movies that you can watch over and over yeah. and over and over. Yeah. And each time you watch them, you're like, oh, flip! I didn't see this the last time. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, speed is die hard on a bus. <laughs> Basically. You know what I mean? But yes. Small I, scale, but not necessarily small scale. Yes. Like a lot of big things happen in a small yeah. scale situation. 100%. These are great yes. things. Um, uh, but yeah, um, this is editing. Um, um, the parts are done so amazing that you end up with a whole that is better than it has any right to be. Right. And the music, the motif. Everything comes together. Yeah, it's insane. So for and me, we, we, give this we need one to a... talk about Bruce Willis's charm, man. The dude was just charming, like no one's business in this. Well, he was playing into himself. He wasn't trying to change. He was yes. trying to change himself. Yes, so I, then, I think he was relatively unknown because, well, I think at the time he was doing like a, he was doing a comedy, right? Yes, that was it. And then he did some weird movie called Hats and Walk. Even though I like it, a lot right. of people don't like it. It's that weird one he goes to Italy and he's like a bank robber. He's like a, not a bank robber, but like a paint thing. He has to get near the Leonardo da Vinci's thing. It's mm. a very weird movie. I recommend it. Because for me, it's a pet like. What is, what's it called? Not pet peeve. Pet peeve. A guilty pleasure. It's a guilty oh, pleasure. Okay. Like, I'll watch it, even though I know it's not that good. But it's called Hudson Hawk. Oh. Absolutely love it. But yeah. Then it was Die Hard. Yes. And his career just skyrocketed like that. Six cents. I mean, I almost want to go over it again. Um, yeah, yo, he, I don't know what he did after. I think he did Die Hard 2. But by the time he did Die Hard 2, was, he was a millionaire, bro. Like, oh, yeah, oh, no, definitely. He was a legend yeah. at that point. Yes. Unfortunately, Die Hard 2 was a bit of a... 
What can you it say? Felt like a, it felt like a repetition of the first movie. Yes. You know those, those sequels that feel like the first movie. Yeah, but you changed. But now they're wearing shoes. Like, yeah. So I, or or uh, the guy is not British. Is is like Russian or whatever. Yeah, that's the difference. Yeah. Because Die Hard Three was a complete change of pace, which I thought was. Man, that, for me, that's why. That's why. If you remember my rating, I said yeah. it's this one. Then it's three. Yes. <laughs> because I feel like three. It's one is three. Yes. Because I feel like th- with three, it's like it, for me, that's the a real sequel. Um, where you see Jeremy Irons is the next best thing after Alan Rickman. How they speak, they sound like brothers. Yes, <laughs> yes, you're right. <laughs> you know. Oh, uh, get this. The comedy you're talking about is Moonlighting, right? Get this. Well, is it Moonlighting? It was before, no, it was during Die Hard. So it was 1985 to 1989, and Die Hard was 1988. Mm. Oh, wow. So you can imagine when he went back to that sitcom, mm. he must have now gotten a higher. Yeah. It's it's kind of like with Will Smith and Martin, because Martin yeah. was doing Martin, Will Smith was doing Fresh Prince. After Bad Boys, yeah. I'm sure they started getting paid way more than they of did. Uh, definitely. Yeah. But I was wrong about Hart and Hort. Hart and Hort came like 10 years later. Never mind. It was a later movie. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. He done twi- he done a lot of TV stuff mostly. And then, yes. yeah. No, no, you're right. Um, there was a movie, but it was go- it's all garbage until Die Hard, yeah. So, yeah. And that's yeah. what blew him up. Yeah. It's kind of like with Robin Williams. Remember Robin, Robin Williams did a comedy? Mm-hmm. Um, and he was just the breakout character. And then he started doing movies. Oh, yes, you're right. Um, I know what it's... Oh, watch. I know what you're talking about. He has like a striped jersey. Uh, it was an alien or something, wasn't he? I don't remember. Yes, really some like elf type thing. Yes, you're yes. Right. An alien, yeah. yes. Because he can just do that. Yeah. He was just that damn good. Yep. And last, last Boy Scout is here. Yes. Uh, uh, With Keenan, right? Um, yeah, the Wayne's brother, yes. Yes. Um, or was it Damon? I think it was Keenan. I think you're right. It's Keenan, not Damon. Not Damon. Yeah. 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 But anyway, yeah. Then of course, Paul came Pulp Fiction later on, and, and then, you know, yeah. for me, I feel like, oh man, you know, the thing about what made these guys have star power mm-hmm. is they each had something. Like with Van Damme, we mentioned that it was the stretching and the the kicks. Um, with Steven Seagal, it was his hand combinations and breaking people's arms. With Bruce Willis, how he holds a gun and how he fires a gun. No one looks cool now. But he's also <laughs> very normal. Do you know what I mean? He's what? He's a very normal guy as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One hundred percent. Yeah. You can't tell me this man is six five, six five. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas a lot of these actors are actually like six feet tall. Like you'd be surprised how tall some of these guys are. Right. Yeah. Like but Tom I know Cruise. him, Tom. Um, Tom Cruise is short. But Tom Cruise, Tom. yes. Tom Cruise and Van Damme. Taller than us, but he's short. He's considered short there. But Van Damme, all these other guys. Yes. Will Smith is pretty big. Steven Seagal is over six, way over six feet. He's actually a big man. Right. Um, Dolph. Yeah. Dolph, Dolph is Rick, of course, is a giant. Yes. Yeah, they're all like physical specimens. Bruce Willis' borderline has a belly dog. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> he's just short of a belly. <laughs> yeah. That's what made him special. He's an everyman. Yeah. yeah. And it worked. Yeah. And that's the thing with The Rock. They try to make him an every. Muscle man McRock guy is here being like on skyscraper, guys. I'm just like you. Let me tell you something, brother. <laughs> You're not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> I don't smell what you're cooking, bro. I don't. <laughs> I don't smell it. I'm sorry. I just don't. It's too. It's too expensive. <laughs> but you get what my point is. Sometimes yeah. Just yeah. be. Have you seen when you Keanu Reeves? A beautiful, tall, you know, specimen, right? right? Handsome man. Exactly. Him playing John Wick makes perfect sense. Yeah. But in Die Hard, it would make no flipping sense. It's like, you know, it's like... Um, it's like if Adam Sandler did an action movie and became really successful in it. Yeah. And started doing more action movies and was still convincing. That's exactly what happened here. Basically. Same thing. Same thing with uh, Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton used to do comedy, and yeah. then when they called him for Batman, they were like, "What?" There were even petitions, talk like Beetlejuice. Yes. 
You know what I mean? Like, no way. Comedians make the best drama. No one will ever convince me of this, dude. Oh, that's true. No that's one will true. ever convince me of anything else. Yeah. They can, that one. I think it's about timing. Timing mm. is a skill. Mm. And um, drama gives you so much time. Right. But I mean, like, you get to sit in the moment and wallow. Whereas yeah. comedians, like, even in Bridget Jones, if I said jokes per minute, because yes. you know, you gotta, you gotta throw in, there's a, there's a skill mm. element to it. That's why Jackie Chang works, because, well, he learned that Chinese opera stuff, you know, that would probably taught him a lot of timing. And then, of course, yeah. martial arts taught him a lot of timing. Right. So that probably combines nicely to make a little combination. Chris Tucker, same thing, you know, like, yeah. there's a big difference between Smokey and mm-hmm. Carter. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Kata is funny, but when he's serious, he's serious. Yes. And you take him seriously. Absolutely, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's my tangent. Anyway, I give this a 9 out of 10. What about you? Yeah, I also give it a 9, man. It's crazy. Like, it's it's one of the best. Like, uh, I enjoyed every moment of this movie, man. Every moment of it I enjoyed. It Obviously, a- yeah. You do see some extras here. You see that this extra... It's not McLean or whatever. And there are moments where you feel like, no, you could have died here. Yeah. You know? I mean, Hans could have died. He did not fake that accent. Yeah. Yes. Um, and also, I feel like even if you fake the accent, can't you hear that this is Hans? Like the voice. Well, I don't know, man. I remember that other guy when he, when he was talking to the policeman. I was like, oh, damn. I was like, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good accent right there. Oh, and the thing is, Hans is multilingual as well. Yeah. So he can speak Russian and whatever. So, yeah, it is convincing, actually. But I mean, I still get what you're trying to say. No, I, I agree with you on that level. But no. Yeah. I but I guess it's, it's, if it's people that you were speaking to, that you just met today, maybe it's not so easy to recognize their voice. Because yeah. everything everything happens in one night. True. But remember, the Brits sometimes have some of the best accents, though, don't they? They do. I mean, look at Kick-Ass, we just talked about earlier. Dude. Dog. Idris Elba in um, The Wire. Dog. You know what I mean? Yeah, even um, the other one he did with Denzel Washington shoots him. Gangs of New York? Is it Gangs of New York? No, no, it's um not Gangs of New York. It's um King King um not Kingdom Come man. Um American uh, ga- American gangster. American gangster. There we go. You wanna kill me, Frank, in front of all these people? You wanna kill me, Frank? And then he says Dad has breakfast, dog. Like nothing ah. happened, dog. Dog. Yeah. Movie and a half. We need to. I was thinking about it the other day. I'm like, I cannot believe that Ti agreed to be Common's child. Like, <laughs> how did that happen? But I guess yeah, Ti has a small build, so it it would be convincing for him to be a child. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, but the man wanted to act or something. Who knows? Pardon? Maybe he just wanted to act. Yeah, you know that these movies where almost everybody is in, isn't it? You realize that it's like Oppenheimer. Like almost okay. every actor, you know. Dog. <laughs> like, Actors you don't even understand. Like, why are you here? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like when I saw David Crumholtz, I was so happy because I'm a huge David Crumholtz fan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I haven't seen him in a very long time. So I don't know whether he was really wearing a fat suit or if he gained weight over the years. But it was really good because the last time he really played a genius on that level was in Numbers. I don't know if you remember the series Numbers. Uh, where he was like a mathematician helping his older brother to solve crimes through math. Oh. Um, and he was in You Stupid Man, 10 Things I Hate About You, and all of that. I mean, those are some of the movies we'll, we'll okay. do. Yeah. I mean, but, could, yeah. that kind of reminds me of, um, what's his face? Um, Oppenheimer, the director. Um, Nolan. Christopher Nolan, there we go. Like, I almost feel like he was going full Tarantino with some of the actors he was pulling up for Dark Knight. I mean, the guy that plays Maloney, like, that guy shows up in, like, B-movie, straight to DVD, ETV. <laughs> you know, he's actually playing one of the head gangsters. Do you know what I mean? Who, uh, there's uh, Maloney, Maloney and there's Falcone. Who, who, are, who are you talking about? Not enough. Was there's Eric Roberts? <laughs> yeah, Eric Roberts, that's his name. Eric oh. Roberts is, is a, I don't want to say a B-level actor, but this man does C movies. He doesn't even do B movies anymore. This is, you know that he is, I think he's Julia Roberts' brother or something, right? No ways. I'm telling you, Eric Roberts, Google it, dog. I think it's related to... Uh, she's a bad sister. If, if Eric Roberts... Is, is, you know, you know what people don't realize is Eric Roberts was a big deal at a point, eh? Yeah. 
like in the like eighties maybe. But this yes, one. and then he started. You remember Best of the Best? Um, no, nah, I don't know that one. You don't know Best of the Best, Tom? Ah. But yeah, dude. You, you see it now? No, you googled it, didn't you? I looked at my, I look at Eric Roberts right now. Yeah. Yeah. Maroni. Here we go. Maroni. Yeah. Is is related to to Julia, isn't it? Uh, I'm looking it up right now. I'm not seeing anything yet. Uh, yeah, he's, he's the brother. He's Julia Roberts's brother. And his child is Emma Roberts. You know Emma? Emma Roberts? Huh? No. Do I? Do you know a movie called Where the Millers? Ah, but that is actually a rating. Yeah. Yeah. And his daughter is actually a, an actress as well. Oh. Mm, you know his daughter. Trust me, you know her. All I'm saying is this woman could have gotten a better jobs. <laughs> He was in. He was in. Um, in Oppenheimer. Yeah, cause yeah, cause once once you're friends with Christopher Nolan, he doesn't let you go. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I think, but it, I think it's also safe to get. But you know what I've noticed about Christopher Nolan? He's very smart. Yeah. There are some people that he doesn't. He makes sure not to include in the same movie. Like he, if he was to get Kristen Bell, he wouldn't get Leo. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like he like is very smart when it comes to stuff like that. Or. Or oh, he would get Matthew McConaughey. Wait, but why not though? What a good combination. I would love to see um, Leo. Leo, Bale. Bale and um, Hugh Jackman. No, no. Bane. Matthew McConaughey. Bane. Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy in the same movie. Can you imagine those three in the same movie? Oh, yeah, because Tom Hardy actually was in two movies with both of these people. Yes. But I think there was a rumor that Leo wanted to play the Riddler or... Nolan wanted Leo to play the Riddler and uh, Leo refused, something like that, because Leo doesn't want to do superhero movies. want to do superheroes. It's like, calm your egos down, you bastards. <laughs> He's not, it's, it's, it's Christopher movie. Nolan. He'll get you an Oscar nomination of a Batman movie. <laughs> Don't you worry. The reason I'm mentioning uh, Hugh Jackman is because he was in The Prestige. Of course, yes. Mm. Even Scarlett Johansson was in The Prestige, but that's before she blew up. Of course. But now here's the thing, though, with, with Hugh Jackman. I love Hugh Jackman, but I sometimes wonder how good of an actor is he really? Like, how do we rank him? Like, I love Hugh Jackman again. I love him as Wolverine. He's the perfect Wolverine. You know what I mean? Like, I can't picture anyone else Wolverine. He's so good. I think but like, when I think of, like, a dramatic movie, like, okay, could you put Hugh Jackman... Like, you know how you said you could put Samuel Jackson inside a Denzel Washington movie, which you couldn't do the other round? Yeah. Can't you put Hugh Jackman in a Leonardo DiCaprio movie? Could think, he have played um, I think What's His Face in Django? Candy. Could you imagine him playing? I think he Mr. could have. I, nah, I, dude, I can't I, imagine. You know why? I've, have you watched Swordfish? His would sound like garbage, number one. Has, <laughs> have you watched Swordfish? Yeah, of course I have. You don't think his performance was great? Le, Le I didn't even know he was in it until you said it right now. He's the main character. And he's very, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> Halle Berry, John Travolta, of course, I'm like, Hugh Jackman. Have you watched uh, Le Miserable? Le Miserable? Of course, I hated it. Not I love musicals. I'm not talking about the singing part. I'm talking about... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the singing part of the musical? Oh, my God. There's, there's, there's a part with... There's a movie with him and Ewan McGregor. And uh, Michelle Williams. I forgot the name of that movie. I don't know that one. Beautiful movie, man. Again, I'm not saying he can't act. Don't no, I get you. Acting. I get you. I'm saying, and that, I'm not saying he's not a good actor. That he, he cannot pull off. Yes, That's I mean, there's a reason he's never, has he even been nominated for an Oscar? I don't think so. Yeah. No, again, that's not technically a thing, a sign of greatness. Again, he's great. He's one of those guys where you can't deny that he's great. Absolutely. But he's no, he's, he's no yeah, Queen Phoenix. He's, exactly. He's no Queen Phoenix. Even though I still have to watch Napoleon. Even though people have been ripping hey, it. Hey, hey, uh, people are saying that it, I mean, I was yeah. watching an interview with Patrick Bet David and he was saying, yo, he was miscast. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Like, first of all, Napoleon was like 35 years old. What the fuck is happening? This man is 50 something years old. <laughs> right. And he was, and plus, Napoleon was in his 20s through most of his major achievements. Mm. And you've got a 50 something year old. I'm gonna need you to calm down. Isn't uh, it like 
similar to how they cast Colin Farrell for Alexander. Like, yeah. that's Wait, the worst oh. person to cast as yeah, Alexander. At least Oliver Stone had the, had the balls to be like, yeah, the biggest... When, okay, this, this, is what, this is what Oliver Stone once said. The biggest failure that Alexander ever achieved was my movie. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> man hated his own film. Uh, credit your credit is due. Man was like, nah, this isn't it. And everybody actually thought that that movie was going to become a hit, including... Yeah, of course. Um, Think about it. Colin Farrell was on fire. Yeah, um, he was doing like SWAT. He was doing The Recruit. Yeah. He was in he's Daredevil. A, he's a good actor. But I think... Oof, this is actually something I'm, I'm struggling with Colin Farrell as well. Because again, once he, if he plays his language, I think he's a better actor. Oh, the, the like, Irish. Uh, Rouge. And um, what's it, that one with... with it's it's the... Irish, right? He's an Irish. I think, so, yes, he's an Irishman. Mm. Um, there's another one that, is, that, that just came out now. I've been watching scenes. I haven't watched the whole movie yet. Oh, with his friend, the guy from the... the, the, the... Also in Bruges, yeah. Yeah, I, I, where, where they are friends or something. Yes, right? and yeah. the one's like, I'm not, I don't know your friend anymore. Yes. I watched this whole scene of him, dude, just having like, this whole thing. I'm like... Whew. Brilliant. Whew. Yo, I don't know what the story is about, but I feel it, dude. My man, like, Colin Farrell, for me, I think also he was miscast a lot. Yeah. I think I think Hollywood uh, focused too much problem. on his looks, mm. and they tried to make him an action star instead of focusing too much on, you know, like, with Heath Ledger, for instance. Heath, I was going to say Johnny Depp, but yeah, yeah, Heath Ledger, yeah. He uh, wanted. They wanted to make him a hot throb. Mm. He refused. Mm. You could say the same thing. Had Colin Farrell refused, we could have seen. He could have won an Oscar early. Yeah. He could 100%. have. Won I mean, same phone thing with Keanu Reeves. Yes. Phone Keanu Reeves. Yeah. You are alone in a booth. That's yeah. like if we take out the the other people's dialogue aside. Yeah. He is. Alone in a phone booth. Yeah, and he had to hold his weight. Yeah. He had to, he had to carry a movie. Yes. And he I did. I don't want to see The Rock in the phone booth. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I I think think I, the hate you have for The Rock is. is no, is... I think it's, I like The Rock. I, I, I love The Rock so much. But <laughs> right now, him bailing out of. Him bailing out of. Um, what is it, movie? Shazam? Yeah. Shazam 2. Mm. What's wrong with you? His beef, okay, no, I actually understand. He, I'm actually on his side with his beef with um, Vin, Vin Diesel. I think, look, if Vin Diesel is going to show up his, on his own time, you have every right to be mad. Right. Do you know what I mean? Right. That's fine. But and oh, but the fact that this man has clauses in all his contracts where he has to, like, look good. Yeah, you, 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 can't, you can't punch him more than five times. Yeah. And the that's, the, that's the... The only t- he noticed that when he saw Vin Diesel's contract, uh, not really saw it, but he learned that during Fast and Furious that you cannot beat, you cannot punch uh, Vin Diesel five more than five times. He's like, oh, I'm doing the same thing. That here's the problem with that. The Rock has <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We don't do that shit anymore. In the '90s, in the days of Wesley Snipes. Those contracts, Chuck Norris. yes, those contracts made sense mm. in the post 2010s. Those contracts make no fucking sense anymore, right? Now you just come off as a douchebag. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You just come off as lame, right? Uh, so now he's now he just out here wearing the same shirt in 10 movies. Have you seen those memes? <laughs> like, I, I dare you to guess which movie this is. <laughs> He'll be in the jungle wearing a brown shirt. <laughs> And they'll be like, can you guess which movie it is? Is it The Rundown? Is it The Manji? Is it... And then insert two other movies here. And it's like, yeah. And like, oh, good point. I don't know. I don't know which jungle yeah. this is. I don't know what shirt that is. But the same thing could be said about Vin Diesel, bro. Whether he's wearing a white vest or a black vest. Which yeah. movie am I watching? Is it a Fast and Furious movie? Yes. Yes. Or what? What's going on here? Luckily, by now, we all know it's the Fast and Furious movie. He doesn't have other ones. Right. right. <laughs> but there was a time when, like, this man, he played a lawyer. Did you ever need to play, like, a mafia F- guy? Find me, find me guilty. I find, like that. Find Vinny, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I said, yeah, find me guilty. Sorry, I'm thinking my cousin Vinny. But yes, find me guilty. Didn't he die in the knockaround, guys? 
Didn't his character die? Knock around no, I don't down. think he died. But he was like a like a bouncer. Yeah, that one was a tough guy. There was a tough yes. guy there. Yes. But he wasn't the main character. He was a side character. No, he, he was, was a side up. character. Because that was, I think, immediately after The Fast and Furious. No, I wasn't that one of his early movies. Was uh, it before? Because I think the first movie that he gained prominence in was uh, Saving Private Ryan, right? Yes. But I don't know if he really gained prominence for that. But yes, yes. Well, I, he, he became noticed, I think. Yes. Because he also mentions that that's the movie that really helped him get somewhere. And it makes sense because some of these actors were actually in... Um, what's it? Barry Pepper was in um, Presenting Private Ryan. Who? Uh, Barry... Ah, uh, fudge. Um, the guy... Who was he playing as in Saving Private Ryan? Um, I think he was a sniper. I think he was oh. playing a sniper in Saving Private Ryan. That guy, guy he's in the guy who guys. Praise, who prays... Yes. 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 Um, yeah, knock around guys, what year, let's see this. I think it was probably like 2005, six, no, maybe three, four. You might be right, I think you're right, I think knock around guys is... Okay, did he not add it as part of his credits? Okay, knock around guys is 2001. Ah, that was either before or after Fast and Furious. And then... Because he was like the muscle, right? He was like yeah, the thing. Triple X is 2002. How's that? Triple X is 2002. Yes. Uh, Fast. No, Fast and the Furious is 2009. No. I can't be right. No, no, no. That's that's the fourth Fast and the Furious. The first Fast and the Furious, I think it came out in 2000 or 2001. How does it stop here? Uh, let me check quickly. Yeah. So, so 2001 as well, you're right. So it's same year. So yeah, was, so so Save It Private Ryan was 98. Yeah. Then he did The Iron Giant in 99. So and then, that came first, yeah. Then he did Boiler Room. Then he did Pitch Black in 2000. Really? That came first? Yeah, Pitch Black came first. And then Fast and Furious and Knock Around Guys came out in the same year. Now that's interesting. Because I know the fact that he got noticed was he shot his own short film, which is well done for him. Yes, um, isn't it Awakenings? Yeah, some weird name, yeah. No, no, sorry. Um, that's I not, see that's it. It's not the one. It's, I think it's... It's multi Multifacial. Mm, I've actually watched that one. I actually, I watched it from beginning to end. It's kind of funny. It, it's it's um, like a... It's like about his life, right? It's basically... Yeah, it's basically a, a thing about his life. Multifacial, you're right. You can basically he say... It, he directed like, it, he produced it, he starred yeah. in it. Yep. Even the music. <laughs> yes. But that's amazing, though. He took a huge risk on himself. Eh? I actually saw a YouTube video that was basically uh, talking about how he he basically invested in himself. Ah, uh, I think I may have seen the same video as you then. Yeah, I through watched the movie. Through. I couldn't see what it was like. I want to check it out. Is it good? No. Because like, it's, it's about him as a bouncer, right? Yes, but understand something. When, I, when it's about him as a bouncer, what it is, it's... 90% of the movie is him on the streets or in the, in his apartment. Yes. And at, outside of an audition, you never see him at a club because you can't afford that. So um, it's simple scenes like that, you know what I mean? And then at the end, there's a nice monologue at the end that he does um, where he's doing an audition role and he kind of like does a monologue about his life. Right. That's pretty beautiful. I won't lie, that's pretty great. But it's a low-budget movie. It's something that we would make. It's self-funded, basically. Yes. So... Mm. Think of it like as a low budget. So when you think he's a bouncer, understand what you're going to see is him coming home, not him in a club talking to someone. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if you're willing to watch that, then it's not bad. Then it's is not it like then, clerks. Like clerks. If you were to watch clerks, for instance, with uh, it's Kevin. It's cheaper looking than clerks. It's worse than clerks. <laughs> yes. Yes. Do you know what's funny is that? Do you, do you ever want to be behind the camera? <laughs> you know. You know. You're not okay. Donovan, our mutual friend, yeah, he says I should be a director. I don't know what he sees. <laughs> I really don't know. Uh, I, okay, then you should watch it then. I don't know if I want to be behind the camera. Hey, dude, I get it. My, I actually talked to my sister about this as well, where she's like, you should pick something. Don't try to do everything. Try to get good at one thing first. Yes. So I, I, yeah. I got the same advice as well when I went to... Striker Entertainment, you know the, the company that does Super Strikers? Yeah. Because I went there and then I met this lady and she's like, what do you want to do? I'm like, no, I want to, she's like, no, 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 no. 
no, no, no. Uh, what do you want to do exactly? No, no, no. I, I want to draw. I want to do the comics. I want to. She's like, no, 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 no. Like, no, what, that's one aspect, what, yeah. Yes, what do you want to do? I'm like, okay, you know what? I want to be like Walt Disney. That's what I told her. And I think that sort of, you know, made things clear for me. Then I started realizing that I can't be sitting down and drawing. Yeah. I need to find people to draw. <laughs> so, yeah, that's I don't think I want to be... So well. Oh, that's kind of a motivational speech, actually, because you're actually doing so well that other people will volunteer. Like, that's one thing I like about me, right, is that... um. I want to do this directing thing so badly. Well, no. What I want to do is create. That's my that's my vision. I want to create. Right. So what I want to do is create worlds. That's what I call it. Right. So what did I do? I try to stay, take up programming to try and make worlds in video game universes. So right. what I do, I try to take up comic books, my drawing, to try to right. do it there. Yes. Try to do it there. Yes. And I realized my most effective tool is pen and paper. So right. I'm focused there. And right. what that that got so I did I focused on that so much that I got actors to volunteer to work with me. Like, do you know yeah. what I mean? Yes. If you do one thing well enough, people will show. Especially that's what, that's some true. out there. Yeah. Actually, what you're saying about the pen and paper, that's something that Akira Kurosawa said. Because I remember there was a video that, there was an interview that he did a long time ago. Yeah. Where they asked him, that, is there any advice you would like to give the young people? And he said, look, write as often and as much as possible with yeah. a pen and paper. Mm. Do that. You know, don't run away from that. Yeah. Right. And he was he's one of the best directors of all time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, yeah. this was talking. a cool tangent. I like this. Tangent. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, guys, let us know what you guys think about Die Hard. Um, we gave you our thoughts. We give it a nine out of ten. We really, really love it. Yes, it is a Christmas movie. Sometimes I feel like it's not, but I think Rob <laughs> yeah. convinced me that it actually is. I mean, there's even a joke where um, Vin Diesel, um, sorry, Bruce Wayne is like, no, Bruce Willis is like, are you going to play some Christmas songs? Those guys are like, this is a Christmas song. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, so, yeah, guys, let us know. What are your, what are your thoughts? Mm-hmm. Is this your favorite Die Hard movie from the franchise? Who do you think would have um, been the best actor to replace Vin Diesel if they do a reboot? I think that's a question that maybe we need to throw you out there. Vin Diesel? Uh, I keep saying Vin Diesel. I keep, you know, in, in even if when we're not talking about this, yeah. I have a bad, um, I don't know what to call it, a bad habit of mixing Vin Diesel and Bruce Willis. I don't know why. But okay, it's, it's boldness. Weird. Now I'm going to be added to that list. I'm going to be added to that list. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, uh, who do you think would have replaced Bruce Willis in this film if they were to do a reboot? Let us know. Um, and yeah, don't forget to like and subscribe. And thank you so much, guys, for watching. Dude, uh, Police Story is doing over, t- it's, it's 2,000 uh, views now. What oh, damn, man. On the, on the other channel. On the other channel, it's 57. But on this other channel, it's it's 20, it's, it's over 2,000 views. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah. Much appreciated. Yeah. I hope we I hope we we keep it going. I hope we keep the momentum. We get yes. a lot more 2K and even more than that. <laughs> yes, I <laughs> want it. From myself, Mr. Extraordinary, and from Rob Sivego, guys, we'll see you on the next one. Cheers. Cheers.